Okay, mogoče, če začneš, Nina, imamo še minuto. Jurija ne bo, tako da lahko Marjana Pihmečka presnaje, če ne bo, ni problem. Iščemo čas na konsulko, nekaj na kampusu, tako da upam, da bo našla. Ja. Nina bo začela prihaja s svojim zoomom noter, ker mislim, da bolj do tega, kar posebno se vsi vidite na večjem zaslonu, kot kar če smo na odru. Ja, si uspela? Zum. Pa pa najboljši da priješ sam. Pa izčajamo tukaj. Ja. Jaz sem kar na Edo Rom. Welcome everyone to six Slovenian academic Australian Slovenian Australian Academic Association, as we know it as Triple A, our annual conference here in Perth today. Uh, my name is Nina Pachayat and I'm the secretary of the FAAA and I'll be your MC to that for today. Um, before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge the Widget people of the Nibra Nation as the traditional custodians of this country and its waters that Murdoch University stands on Nibra country. We pay our respects to Nibra elders past and present and we acknowledge their wisdom and advice in our teaching and our cultural knowledge activities. Um, for everyone who, I guess, we don't have to, um, um, yeah, so, okay, we got some honorary consul here, yeah. <laughs> it's great to see you. You can see that, yeah. Okay, so we have just started and the right time you came, <laughs> we're glad that you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, gra grab some water or some okay. tea outside. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I would just like to invite Dr. Kaya and play the president of our this SAAA um, to welcome you now. Thank you, Nina. Um, Lepo zdrav usem udeležencem današnjega dogodka. Tako tistim tukaj v Prcu, kot tudi sem vam online. Hi everyone, 
to all our participants of the today's event here in Perth, as well as to those online. On behalf of the Slovenian Australian Academic Association, SUPLA, and our co organizers, the Association of Slovenians Educated Abroad, UTIS, and the Slovenian Australian Chamber of Commerce, I'm welcoming you to our sixth SUPLA conference. Your Excellency, Mr. Matej Archon, Minister for Slovenians Abroad. Your Excellency, Mr. Marko Ham, the Ambassador of the Republic of Slovenia in Australia. Honorary Consul of the Republic of Slovenia for Western Australia, Mrs. Mariana Kakar. Honorary Consul of the Republic of Slovenia for Victoria, Professor Srečko Kontel, OIM. Honorary Consul of the Republic of Slovenia for Queensland, Dr. Yuri Karlovček. I must actually say that um, Yuri was unable to travel to, um, uh, to Perth, um, but hopefully he might join us uh, later um, if he can. Associate Professor Martin Breukner, representing um, our host University Murdoch here in Perth. Keynote speakers. Artist and architect, Professor Marietica Potrč, Professor Danilo Turk, the president of the Slovenia and the, uh, the president of the Club de Madrid and former president of Slovenia. Industry speaker, Mr. Dusan Olai, general manager of Dual Company, distinguished guests. We're honored to host you at our annual networking events, uh, connecting individuals and organizations interested in knowledge exchange between Slovenia and Australia and their respective regions. After the disruptions related to the COVID-19 restrictions, we are delighted to finally uh, be back in person, meeting our friends and supporters, this time in Western Australia. As a silver lining of the global pandemic, we are excited to announce our hybrid events are here to stay. They give everyone around the world the opportunity to join. Now, we just need to figure out our time zones. Before that, we would like to thank Dustra Utis for video recording this blended session. It will be later available on their YouTube channel. This year conference too has a fantastic lineup of speakers. You will also hear from the Slovenian Australian academics, from book authors, entrepreneurs, and undergrad and postgraduate students, including the American Slovenian Education Foundation ASEF fellows. Our sincere gratitude to the sponsor of the event, the Government Office for Slovenians Abroad, our hosting partner, Murdoch University, and our supporter, the Embassy of the, of the Republic of Slovenia in Canberra. So thank you all speakers and attendees for joining us today. We wish you an inspiring day. Nina, back to you. Perfect. Um, thank you, Kaya. <laughs> um, so now I would just like to um, invite uh, our professor Martin yeah, uh, he's a co-founder and co-director at the University Center of Responsible Citizenship and Sustainability at Murdoch University, and he will just uh, welcome you all. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Um, it's a great privilege and pleasure uh, to be speaking here this this afternoon and I thank the organizers for for the invitation to give this a promise brief brief address. Uh, firstly I also wish to acknowledge the Wajok and Bindara people of the Munga Nation uh, whose lands we're meeting today and pay my respect to elders past present and emerging also recognizing that sovereignty has never been ceded. A warm welcome to you all to this sixth annual conference of the Slovenian Australian Academic Association. My name is Martin Bruckner and I'm here with Murdoch University, which is, I dare say, the right place for you to be, um, simply because looking at your conference theme, sustainability, environment and community, 
uh, these things are very well aligned with the foundational values of Murdoch University, which since inception has been a green university and been very committed to sustainability even long before that term became mainstream. So our commitment to sustainability is deep rooted and authentic. The conference theme is also very timely um, as the world community finds itself in a tight grip of numerous interlinked social, economic and ecological crises. Indeed, according to the 2022 doomsday clock statement by the Science and Security Board of uh, the Bulletin of the Atomic Sciences, it is 90 seconds to midnight. That's a situation that hasn't even been accounted at the height of the Cold War and is, if you like, the unholy combine of the threat of nuclear conflict, climate change uh, induced insecurities and accelerated environmental change. And this shows that sustainability is no longer a desirable option, but in fact, a long overdue response to very real and pressing threats of our own making. Now, a cursory glance at the doomsday clock suggests that we have entered a new era of risk and uncertainty. Earth system scientists refer to this era as the Anthropocene, the age of humans, accounting for the fact that we've become the strongest telluric force on this planet, moving more material and, um, and geological material than any other force on, on this planet. And that is largely being done to enable us to energize, urbanize and domesticate uh, ecosystems at a rather grand scale. Now, unsurprisingly, this human success story has also come with enormous ecological cost and being responsible for profound disruptions of biochemical science. Ecosystems worldwide show signs of serious uh, degradation, extinction rates are way above background levels, and the suddenness of biodiversity loss has not been seen since the age of the dinosaurs. Atmospheric CO2 concentrations continue to rise, and our current global warming trajectories of 3.7 degrees by the end of the century. For Australia alone, such warming would incur a cost of around $130 billion per annum, or to impacts on infrastructure, productivity losses, and impacts on health. So in short, um, our model of development, our own industrial modernity, if you like, is derailing the Earth's geological trajectory. And it seems that our attempts to free ourselves from its to growth on this finite planet that we're living on um, have not only resulted in environmental disruptions, it is these disruptions that now very much limit our options for living within nature's safe operating space. Now, despite all this doom and gloom, and despite the current alarming state of play, uh, we still have the opportunity to change humanity's trajectory on Earth. The IPCC points to a small window of opportunity that still exists to address climate change. Um, in Australia, for instance, we would have the technology available to become carbon neutral for stationary energy generation by 2030, to just give you one example. Nature has also the capacity to bounce back. Um, the phase out of ozone depleting substances has meant that since the late 1980s, the ozone hole is closing and is expected to make a full recovery by 2070. New Materials are being developed, such as bioplastics, bringing us closer to a truly circular economy. Uh, new food crops promise greater resilience, higher yields and reduced reliance on animal protein, helping us to significantly reduce our ecological footprint and to improve animal welfare. So even though much progress is being made in the sustainability space, still structural challenges do remain, such as the incompatibility of growth economies with the thermodynamic realities of this planet as well as a growing gap between rich and poor. And that's despite decades of unprecedented levels of wealth generation, often in the name of poverty eradication. Now, to my reading, in many ways, these are design problems. And I quite often tell my students, many of them can be solved with the stroke of a pen, um, such as, for instance, us becoming agnostic to economic growth. Others require innovative social engineering approaches to bring about attitudinal behavioral changes within society that would generate public support for measures such as ecological tax reform, the introduction of resource caps or redistributive policies to counter wealth disparities. So much work is already underway in the area in the space of sustainability and far more work is yet to be done. And that brings me back to the theme of this conference and its importance. The data that I shared with you today makes plain that 
sustainability solutions, solutions are urgently needed. And you're all gathered here today to discuss ways forward to bring about future sustainability for the long-term protection of ecosystems, the safeguarding of, com uh, safeguarding of communities. So given what's at stake, I wish you very much success in your deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Martin. Um, now I would like to invite our um, honorary consul of the Republic of Slovenia, um, Ms. Mariana Kager, um, to say some words. Um, would you be able to join me? You have something? Thank you. Um, I'll share the screen. I'll share the screen. I apologize for a little delay. <laughs> Bi morali da lite zaslon. Um, hello to everybody. I mean, how many people are actually on? Um, currently, fifteen. I'm calling. They're going to show a little bit later. It's the time zones. <laughs> so, hello to everybody from Perth. Um, it's um, it's my honor to speak to everybody today. Um, it's, um, I was told to maybe talk a little bit about my journey, uh, which started in 88, um, coming to Australia. And um, then after I will probably talk a little bit of, about women in mining, um, where, you know, where my, uh, my journey has been for the last 30, nearly 34 years. Um, uh, so um, in, uh, I graduated in, uh, in university in, of Maribor um, uh, as an industrial chemist. And soon after um, uh, made that trip to Australia, we was planned to go for um, just for five years, but um, if it happens, I'm still here. <laughs> um, so maybe if we show the first picture. Um, uh, this is <laughs> this is uh, this is the picture <clears throat> on on a, on a night before we were leaving uh, we're leaving two suitcases um, and. Um, not knowing everybody in Perth, we just chose Perth because it was a fancy small city. <clears throat> and uh, um, that's how, how it all started. We um, first got the job in a, in a local in Perth, and then um, in um, 89, I got the um, job in Kalgurli. Um, next slide, please. Um, and um, for everybody, anybody who has been in Kalgurli before, um, it's all red dirt. Um, the company that I started work with was Dynovas Farmers, which you can see in the car on the car. And now it's um, these days is a huge international um, explosives company called the Dino Nobel. 
Um, I stayed with them for 14 years, learned the trade, and then in 2003, my husband and I um, went on our own um, manufacturing explosives, which we designed. Um, and uh, it was in cooperation with Dino, Dino Nobel at the time. And um, that lasted six or seven years. And in 2009, I started uh, um, another, uh, another company uh, with a couple of partners, um, which is um, another slide, which now it looks that uh, that's what how it looks like in Kalgoorlie. In, in Kalgoorlie. It's a uh, manufacturer certain uh, um, products for mining industry only. We don't buy anybody else, just mining industry. Um, it makes a product called Prisplit, which is a um, um, very important product for open pit mines and also for underground. It's got specific uh, um, purpose. Um, uh, um, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a current picture there. And I also, in 2012, um, I started uh, um, another venture with a Russian company, um, and it was called Nitro Severe Australia. Um, after 10 years, at the end of October, I, I exited the company. It's, going, it's growing too big and it's um, too big the responsibility. I'm getting, I'm getting at a stage when I want to slow down, not, not keep growing businesses. <laughs> um, and then in 2019, we started the company called Phoenix, which is uh, south of Perth. Um, so I have been um, busy over the years, um, um, mainly really uh, designing explosives, um, running the, the companies. I have um, been involved in uh, setting up the, the plants. That's a bit of engineering as well. Um, but my, my passion is, is really um, designing new explosives for different purposes. Just, just maybe okay. Um, um, so, so maybe I, I, I just wanted to go back um, uh, now to, to talk about uh, how, as a, as a woman in back in 89, 99, um, 80, 90s, early 90s, how it was to, to, to be a woman in the mining industry when it. There were not many. I have to say, you know, you come to the mine site and in the camps, I, it was rare that you see a, a, a woman there, apart from kitchens and, and, and cleaners, they, they, I have to say. And uh, I remember clearly one um, uh, my, mine, uh, and mine I had to visit for a few days. Um, they had dongas and in donga was a, well, just one bed, uh, nothing else. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the showers were, you know, 50 whatever meters down, down on the corridor. And when you opened the shower, there were all these cubicles and you had to share them with, with men and toilets the same. So there were no, nothing designated just for women. I remember I put, put the towel around and hope, hope, hoping that there would be anybody, <laughs> any guys you know, being on the ship, you know, um, uh, to, 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 to see me there. It's, uh, um, and I do have to say that uh, that was in, in probably uh, in 1990. It has changed. You have to see more and more women in the in the mining, and um, and not just in kitchens and in cleaners, but also in, in the trucks, uh, surveyors, uh, engineers. And um, now, when you go to the mine site, you have to get your own uh, shower and, uh, and and toilet, so you don't have to share with the whole group of, of men. Um, so that that that's 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 a good good sign that uh, we are women are more recognized in, in, in the in the industry, um, and and. Uh, it, no reason why not not to. We are also be hardworking, reliable, and um, um, you know, smart, I suppose. Uh, um, um, so that's um, um, that, that that that's something that you know. As I was, um, um, you know, quite quite proud that I witnessed witness that shift into into recognizing women uh, also in, in the industry. Um, so um, the other thing that I probably wanted to mention it is I won't be too long anymore but um, when you get old you know my 34 years in Australia just over 34 years but when you get older you know you feel more and more um, that, that you're not really Australian I mean I'm sad to say but I mean that's how it is you know it's in your heart your country just stays with you and uh, um, as much as we are going to home uh, homes calling home every year um, not the last three years because we of COVID, but um, then, then it really hits you even more. You know, I can't even go and visit a friend's family. My mother is uh, aging, and um, um, and, and uh, so, so three years ago, I also had a um, uncle who is here with us today, and he, came, he joined me in Australia. Um, he's from the same 
hometown and I, that I lived there as, 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 uh, as a child. Um, so we decided to, uh, two years ago that we we're going to purchase um, uh, um, an old uh, rundown to it complex uh, about three kilometers from our, uh, where we grew up um, and turn it into a modern touristy place um, with thinking, you know, that um, it's okay, Australia, you know, I love this country and uh, you know, it's giving me all the opportunities that maybe my own country wouldn't. Um, with uh, accepting who I was, you know, not, uh, not uh, asking who your parents were or, or uh, effort doesn't fall so far from the tree and all these things that I was, I listened to when I was growing up. Um, and it made me, um, uh, give me, give me a chance, Australia gave me a chance to, to earn some money, to have some funds to, um, and so we um, decided two years ago that we were going to purchase this complex and the first phase of the complex was finished this year. It's in the next, next slide, it's not the whole thing, but you know, um, this is what... Uh, um, so it's, um, it's just a small part of what, what what's there. Um, uh, it's, it's a sporting complex with two uh, pedal courts, tennis court, volleyball, a good volleyball part. Uh, um, and we have um, um, fish pond, and it's, it's very much in the nature. And uh, the complex was uh, run out for 20 years, uh, and uh, um, and uh, it's, um, nobody really wanted to invest in it. Uh, but we thought, you know, like this is, um, you know, our country educated us, you know, you know, educated, education is free in Slovenia, and this is just our way of us giving something back. Uh, and uh, um, the next phase is now um, building a boutique hotel, which we um, which we uh, just applied for some um, EU funds as well. Um, and uh, the plan is to live in Slovenia for four months per year and um, eight months in Australia and uh, have summer in summer. <laughs> That's a good conversation. <laughs> it is, but you have to wait until you're 60 plus, you know, to be able to, mm. to, to do that. Until then, you just have to keep going to work yeah. and, 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 you know, uh, you know <laughs> Making sure we have a good existence, but but now we, we can afford to do that, and we are very glad we had a, a, a 20, on 27th of September, which says we had an official opening. Um, it was a tourist uh, a World Tourist Day, isn't it? Uh, and um, and we had an official opening, and we are very proud of of, uh, of what we achieved and uh, and uh, what's more to come. What's more to come. There. So that's from me. That's really. Um, thank you, Mariana. That was awesome. thank you for coming. <laughs> it was really inspiring story. Um, I think that gave a lot of people maybe a bit of a nudge to go out of their comfort zone and try something new. Um, um, unfortunately, our minister for Sudanians abroad uh, couldn't join us in person, but um, he did record a video for us. Um, and we're just gonna share that. Dragi studenti in studenti, dragi prijatelji Slovenije in srčem pozdravu vsem udeleženicam in udeleženicam šeste konference Slovenska od Kranskega akademijskega odruženja. Jaz sem vam oglašal iz Argentine, konkretno iz mesta Mendoza, kjer je pravno kar poteka prvo vse slovensko srečenje studenti in slovencov od Blizu in od Kareč. In v tem dni se Slovenke in Slovenci povezujete tudi v Avstraliji, lahko bi rekli na drugem koncu sveta. In prav takšno medsebojno povezovanje in simulovanje na področju akademskem in poslovnem področju je zagotovo neprecenjivega pomena, predvsem na ohranjenje in razvoj naše skupnosti. Zato se je organizatorjem res iz srca zahvaljujem za to pobudo, ki se kontinuirala že šest let odvija. V Slovensko-Avstralijske akademijske odruženju vedno znova poskrbite tudi za aktualne teme in vsebinske razprave. Zato me res veseli, da sem v tej priložnosti, da vam ne na zadnje tako dogovorim in tudi vprašanja, ki naslavljate, vsekakor 
bilo aktualne teme, s katerim se priroko parjamo tudi tu na srečanju v Mendozi, kjer poleg razprave o položaju in prihodnosti slovenske skupnosti dejansko razpravljamo tudi o aktualnih temah, ki so na nek način tudi prihodnost in tudi priložnost pogrobenega gospodarskega sodelovanja, ki na nek način temelji na zelenem, trajnostem in vitalnem gospodarstvu. Za naš vrat je poseben izziv tudi predstavljal vprašanje prihodne generacije, se pravi vprašanje vladi, kako ohraniti v nek način slovensko identiteto, kako mladi položiti vstanje slovenskega jezika še od samega začetka, torej bolj školji veliko in na nek način, kako tudi mladi odličevati v naše aktivnosti. Odnos mladih morajo države, seveda odlogo, za civilno družbo, dogovoriti neke razvojne trajnostne usmeritve, ki ne bodo v nekaj čim vsodno posegali v življenja prihodnih generacij. Tako da, jaz se iskreno upam, da tudi letošnja vaša konferenca vas predvsem poveže čim več ljudi, da vam da nekaj na vnih in ne na zrade, da se skrejo neke nove vezi, ki bo pripomogli k nadatnem razvoju in obstoju tudi naše slovenske skupnosti. Tako da, cenjeni vse skupaj, želim zborno razpravo, organizatorjem pa uspešno izvedbo te konference. Hvala za pozivo. Thank you to um, His Excellent Mr. Mercury Arjun um, for this video um, and the message. Um, now I would like to welcome our His Excellent Mr. Marco Ham, which is our new ambassador of the Republic of Slovenia in Australia. Um, share some words with us. Hello, Lepo uh, Pozdravljeni. Your president and members of the Slovenian Australian Academic Association. Dear Associate Professor Martin Buchner, dear Minister Archon, dear former President of the Republic of Slovenia, Dr. Turk, dear Honorary Consuls, dear speakers and participants, ladies and gentlemen. I begin today by acknowledging the Gunaval and Ngambari people, traditional custodians of the land from which I'm speaking to you today, and pay my respect to their elders, past and present. I also extend that respect to the traditional custodians of the Perth city, the Wajuk and Yungar people, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. It is my honor and pleasure to address your conference today. It holds a special meaning for me since I arrived in Australia only two weeks ago, and therefore it is the first time I have been invited to share my thoughts with you. I do regret I was not able to come in person to Perth, However, I'm sure we will meet next year in Canberra. I'm really looking forward to it. Let me present you with some ideas on how and why Australia and Slovenia could collaborate more and in knowledge exchange, be it in science, research, or student exchange. But let me first present the wider context as I see it. Both Slovenia and Australia are part of the Western and liberal world, which is, for the time being, although some might disagree, the freest and economically and socially most developed. However, the status quo has been contested, the world is changing, and our weight in economic terms is slowly diminishing, while other players, who do not necessarily share our democratic values, are more and more assertive. War is ravaging again on European soil, this time in Ukraine, something many did not believe could happen. The rules-based international order is under threat, and democracies should explore new opportunities and use existing ones to cooperate even more. 
There is also a thinking going on that has started with the COVID pandemic, namely the end of globalization as we knew it. Supply chains, particularly of commodities, products or semi-products of strategic value tend to shorten and regi regi regionalize or tend to be based not only on the cheapest price, but also on ideological or political convergence among buyer and vendor states. Lithium, rare earth minerals, food, gas, microchips, etc., to name just a few. The victors of the 21st century, as it was in the past, will be those who manage to quickly adapt to technological evolution. What the Industrial Revolution posed as a challenge in 19th century that is adapting or being left behind is now digital, digitalization and sustainability. However, today's geopolitical shifts are happening amidst climate change, environmental degradation, population growth, and more and more limited resources. This is why today's theme, sustainability, environment, and community is so relevant. Scientists and scholars have an important part to play in finding solutions to challenges emerging from climate change, environmental degradation, and creating a sustainable and a survivable world. Don't worry, you are not alone. There is huge responsibility on world governments and also on every single one of us. Australia and Slovenia, although far from each other, geographically, which to some degree impedes trade and other exchanges, could and should collaborate more in knowledge exchange, science, industry, research, and student exchange. Let me mention two fields. First is artificial intelligence. Uh, following the official establishment of the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence in Slovenia under the auspices of UNESCO, its name is IRCAI in October 2020, the center has established a dialogue to promote research, uh, excellence, and multi-stakeholder discussion at the intersection of artificial intelligence and sustainable development. A launch event for this center, which was founded by the government of the Republic of Slovenia and is based in the Jozef Stefan Institute, was held in March this year. Over 1,100 registered individuals from 123 countries attended and were addressed by esteemed speakers on the first day of the event. The second field is space. Slovenia promotes development of high-tech companies. In this context, many, many opportunities have opened up in space technology as Slovenia's cooperation with European Space Agency, ESA, has opened up this segment for Slovenian science and the Slovenian economy as well. In recent years, Slovenia has made a tremendous progress in the field of space technology, which in cooperation with companies in the scientific and research sphere can greatly contribute to tackling global challenges. Slovenia has already sent three satellites into space, which they can send very negative images of what is happening with water and climate change. Let me also mention that as many as seven candidates are to become our astronauts. We are reaching exceptional results in terms of technological, technological development and scientific achievements. However, additionally, as you know, Slovenia is also part of your EU. Thus, the important framework to boost our cooperation could also be wider, European one. Australia and the EU have a long history of productive research collaboration dating back to the 90s. The EU's research and development programs are extraordinary in their scope and coverage and make some of the world's largest public sector investments. The latest is Horizon Europe, which will run from 2021 to 2027 and has a budget of 95.5 billion euros. It is around 150 billion Australian dollars. Horizon Europe supports European partnerships in which the EU, national authorities, and the private sector jointly commit to support the development and implementation of a program of research and innovation activities. Uh, the EU, and by extension Slovenia, would welcome deeper international collaboration between Australia and the EU scientists, researchers, and inno innovators. Sorry. With the launch of Horizon Europe in 2021, the EU expects international cooperation to intensify and will, of course, welcome Australia should it decide to partner with the Horizon Europe program. Another path is also through people to people contacts. Slovenian scientists and re researchers living and working in Australia 
have the best insight into their field of work and research and know best where cooperation is realistic and has added value. Think how you could connect the institutions where you work in Australia with similar or complementary institutions in Slovenia. There are Slovenian students studying in Australia and there are Australians studying in Slovenia, particularly those with dual nationality or Slovenian passports since they use the opportunity to get a quality education for free and at the same time visit the country and the continent of their relatives. Regarding knowledge exchange, be it science, research or student exchange, I should mention that exchange should strive to be balanced. Slovenia is a country with only 2 million people and, thus limited, and is thus limited in the number of scientists and experts. We need them, of course, in order to keep step with the developed world. Every country is competing for highly skilled workers and scientists. Therefore, I think this exchange should be somehow circular so as to prevent brain drain. Let me conclude with my opinion regarding the question I got before this concert, uh, conference on how to preserve Slovenianness in Australia. Well, I think a very important part of our identity is our unique and beautiful language. And therefore, as Slovenian scientists and researchers abroad, you are carrying a special burden in this regard. Every language in order to survive as a language of science needs to be used by scientists, researchers, and other intellectuals. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that you publish your papers also in Slovenian, if possible, and that you contribute to the development of scientific vocabulary. If you have moved here permanently, be innovative, be active, and try to pass the Slovenian identity on to your children if you have them. How to do, how to do it? I saw in France, where I lived years ago, there was a basketball match between a Slovenian and French club. And the children around me were mostly from mixed Franco-Slovenian families, all of them speaking fluently in both languages. As long as the Slovenian team was winning, they were cheering with Slovenian flags. And when we lost, unfortunately, at the end, they were all waving the French one. This story maybe teaches us that in order to, for Slovenian identity to survive throughout generations, far from home, we need positive stories, stories about success, since everybody likes to identify himself with something positive, something successful. And this should not be a problem. There are many historic and everyday success stories from and about Slovenia, be it regarding excellent achievements in sports, successful companies, high standard of living, high degree of personal security, or beautiful and clean environment. And with younger generation, generations, we need to make use of digital tools that were not available 50 or 60 years ago when the majority of Slovenes came to Australia. Of course, physical contacts remain important. However, why not try not to try also with WhatsApp or Facebook groups? The lifestyle of everybody has changed with digitalization, so also expatriate communities need to adapt in order to survive. I wish you all a lot of success in your academic field and with today's conference. Thank you. I don't hear anything. Hopefully you heard me. Yeah, we heard okay, you. Okay, no, it's okay. You hear it now? Yes, I hear you. Oh, thank you, Simon. Did you hear me? Yes, yes we did. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I wouldn't want to repeat that. Well, no. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for this. Um, it was very inspiring, um, and we were very lucky and happy to have you uh, today with us. Uh, I'm very welcome to Australia. Um, thank you. you enjoy it as much as we do. Um, now I would like to invite Professor Svetva Kunto, who's an honorary consul of the Republic of Slovenia for Victoria. Um, I would just quickly um, introduce him. Uh, 
He's been um, appointed as honorary consul of the Republic of Slovenia in Victoria uh, in 2022, um, and is uniquely qualified as he also held this role in 2019 and 2020 for the states of Guernsey, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Um, Dr. Kunto is an international lawyer and currently, um, and he's currently in the group General Counsel for International Optometry Group, Bailey Nelson, and he also held the position of Affiliate Professor in Deakin University School of Medicine. Um, he's been awarded um, many awards, um, such as Order of Australia Medal in 2001, um, and in 2003, Dr. Conto was awarded as a Centenary Medal for Services to Local Government, and in 2010 was awarded the Australian Defence Medal for Service the Australian Defence Force. He's going to be talking today about how knowledge is power. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me there. I'll just stop the sound check. All good? Yep. All good. Thank you. So um, on, on the occasion of, of the sixth uh, meeting of the Slovenian Australian Academic Association, I wanted to uh, talk to the group and share uh, an experience that I had whilst um, I was living in uh, Guernsey. Now, Guernsey is um, a little island in the English Channel between England and France. It's a very interesting place, uh, 64,000 people and only 65 kilometres square. So, so quite a small island, but very wealthy and, uh, and, and, and very much relying upon the finance sector. Um, how I came to live in Guernsey is that in 2015, I was working for an optometry group called Specsavers. So anyone living in Australia or New Zealand will be, or England will be very much aware of Specsavers. They're the, the largest privately owned optometry group in the world. And I was promoted as the group uh, general counsel in 2015. And the, the Northern Hemisphere head office of Specsavers is on the island of Guernsey. That's a whole new, another story as to why that is. But um, Guernsey has a very friendly tax regime where um, it's a zero company tax. So the finance sector is a very strong contributor to the economy of Guernsey. So whilst the finance sector provides over 80% of the gross domestic product for the island of Guernsey, the government there is very conscious that all the eggs are in one basket. So back in uh, 2016, the island government decided that they should try to diversify the economy and they're looking for economic opportunities. So they came up with a list of 20 economic opportunities to help diversify the Guernsey economy. And one of those, uh, initiative, economic initiatives was to establish an international university based in Guernsey. But because um, the university, because the university would only be a small, very niche boutique university, it wasn't, it, it felt, it, it was felt that you couldn't have just the one campus. You needed a number of universities working as joint venture partners to create um, a university that was jointly run by a number of international universities attracting international students. So when I arrived on the island in 2015, because of my affiliation with uh, universities for most of my life, I was very excited to get involved in the working group that was looking at establishing an international university uh, in Guernsey. And I felt that with my, with my background with Slovenia, with my background in Australia, that I could certainly look to introduce potential partners from Slovenia, university partners from Slovenia and university partners from Australia. And, and that's how it sort of, that's how my involvement evolved. Um, I joined, I joined um, the working group in 2016 and the group became very, very active and we're looking to identify four, uh, four countries 
to approach to help establish this university. One was going to be Slovenia because of my contacts. The second one was going to be Australia through my contacts at Deakin University. Uh, the third country was going to be Canada because Can uh, Canada, the Brock University in Canada uh, is very closely aligned with Guernsey through, through naming rights because General Brock, who the, uni the University of Brock was named after in Canada, originally came from Guernsey and he was a big war hero in Canada. So there's always there's been a scholarship ongoing between Guernsey and the University of Brock in Canada for some many years. So they were a natural partner. And, and then the, the fourth uh, country was going to be the United Kingdom, just because of its proximity and uh, significant size. So I helped um, put together a delegation to visit Slovenia and we the, the Minister for Economic Development, his chief advisor and I, we went to Slovenia in November 2018, and we met with um, the University of um, the University of Ljubljana. We visited the um, University of uh, Maribor, and um, we also visited the University of Nova Gorica. And uh, all, all three of those universities indicated that they were, they were interested in becoming partners of the Guernsey, International Guernsey University. So we, we, had to, if we had to look which was going to be the best uh, fit for Guernsey. And it was felt that the University of Ljubljana would, would be the best fit. So we invited the University of Ljubljana to join a workshop that um, was organized in Guernsey in uh, May of uh, 2019. And uh, in that workshop, we also had professors from, we had the Professor Marco Pajo from the School of Economics and Business. Uh, so he, he joined us in Guernsey. We had um, the head of, Operations and Information Professor uh, Fletcher from Salford University in the UK. We had uh, two professors from Deakin University School of Medicine from Australia join us, and uh, and also uh, the Professor Greg Finn of the Brock University. And we held a workshop over two days looking at how an international university in Guernsey would work, what the areas of study would be, and at the end, at the conclusion of that workshop, we signed a memorandum of understanding where those four universities agreed to provide a faculty to the uh, International um, University of Guernsey. And the three main areas that the university was going to focus on, and it was interesting to hear His, His Excellency speak about digital innovation, because that was exactly one of the areas that uh, was going to be focused on uh, it was going to be looking at economic, technical, and geographic uh, digital innovation and financial innovation, such as artificial intelligence and blockchain technology, which would fit very nicely into the finance industry of uh, Guernsey. The second area that we were going to develop was environmental studies, which that shouldn't surprise anyone, um, including renewable energy and blue economy, including ocean health particularly as Guernsey, Guernsey is, um, is situated in the English Channel. Uh, it makes, it's, it's a natural fit between Guernsey and, um, and renewable energy and blue economy. And the third area was um, physical and digital creating industries. So that were gonna be the three main areas. And the area that Deakin University of Australia uh, signed up to, uh, to establish was a, an international school of medicine. So very quickly, we were able to put together a, a very compelling international university. And uh, as I said, we, we, we had a memorandum of uh, understanding. Um, the government of Guernsey agreed to build the faculty, the, the, the um, location um, for, the, for the university was identified, it was an old, uh, hospital site that, that had been uh, vacated 
and the hospital relocated to another location. But it, it was a magnificent piece of land that overlooked uh, the island and, and across the across the waters towards France. And so the the location was identified, and a, and a budget of um, one hundred million dollars was set aside by the states of Guernsey to establish the university. So everything looked set to go, and then uh, unfortunately COVID hit. And um, as as was mentioned in the introduction, um, whilst I was whilst I was on the island of Guernsey, because of my interaction with uh, Slovenia, not only in relation to university but other economic development initiatives, uh, I, towards the end of um, 2019, uh, I was approached to, uh, to, to become the honorary consul for the uh, Republic of Slovenia to, to the states of Guernsey, United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. And, and that in fact um, happened. So I was appointed and was really just commencing in that role in the early, early 2020. And unfortunately, uh, as, as we all know, uh, COVID hit and I had to make a decision on whether I was going to stay in Guernsey uh, and see out the, the, the COVID pandemic or return to Australia where my family was based and, and children were at university. And I decided that really, we didn't know how long uh, the COVID crisis was going to continue. So I decided to come back to Australia. I had to unfortunately resign my position as the honorary consul uh, in Guernsey uh, in 2020. So the project of the International University of Guernsey has, was put on hold for the last two years, but it's a project that is still very much on the economic agenda for Guernsey. And it's a project that I'll, I'll try to um, engage with again, given that Deakin University was going to be a major player and Deakin is in my hometown of Geelong, where I'm, uh, where I'm based. And I'll look to, to uh, reactivate that project, um, Your Excellency. And it might be one that we can speak about again, because the, the mm -hmm. uh, University of Ljubljana was very passionate uh, to be part of this project, which would, which would uh, see some 2,000 students. And there'd be an active exchange program between Slovenia and Guernsey. And, and the government of Guernsey was prepared to uh, help with uh, accommodation costs and also transport costs for students uh, taking up opportunities in Guernsey. So it's going to be a very generous and very easy way for students to exchange between uh, the participating countries and, and Guernsey. And Guernsey was seen as a very safe island where parents would feel very confident sending their students, uh, their, their children to study where they could study English as a natural part of the Guernsey environment, um, but also uh, uh, supplement their studies in a very international university environment. So all, mm -hmm. all the reasons mm -hmm. for the establishment of the university uh, still stack up. It's just that the um, unfortunate the world has somewhat uh, has scrambled because of COVID. And once things start settling, possibly in 2023, it would be a time to dust off and just review where that where that project is at and, uh, and possibly mm -hmm. pick up uh, where we finished up in May 2020. So mm -hmm. that that was um, that was my presentation today. And it's a it, it's a project that I was very passionate about whilst I was living in Guernsey. And I hope that maybe um, we could we can see this project come to life uh, in the near future. Thank you, Professor um, Fischer. Uh, that was really lovely. Yes. Um, next one I would like to invite is Dr. Usha Kumat, who's a senior lecturer um, and director of academic programs in architecture in Western Sydney University. Um, Usha Kumatsi is a senior lecturer um, and she's registered architect from Europe and holds a BA in architecture, MSc in landscape architecture from the University of Ljubljana and a PhD from Barcelona School of Architecture. Um, she has worked as an architect and as an architectural critic for more than 20 years. 
And um, from 2015 to 17, she was a CI on an OLT teaching grant, exploring new paths for a PhD in architecture. And today she'll be talking about city form, economics and culture for architecture of public space. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Anas apika umis. Kaya apika. Anas la Antel antle. 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 Yep. Antle. Ed. Ah, so ah ah ah. Ah, so ah. 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 Ja and then I
the, all the um, mayors were there from all the What is the problem with the right to the water? Uh, you have to apply for it. What's the water? Is it one right to the key or what? Because the water is still there. You have to have a concession. Yeah, but it's a uh, right to the water. Yeah, but it's a very long process to get to the concession, in fact. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a very long process to get to the concession, in fact. And to have the rights then. But there were several people who were really interested in, in the past to, to come to that concession. but not to do anything else uh, around what we were, we were doing now, but just to have the, the right to, to distribute the water. Because water nowadays in, in the world is a, it, it is, it's a very special commodity. Yeah. And, uh, especially if the, the water is like that, uh, uh, as the spring is in, in Rimsky Urelets. Because Rimsky Urelets was known in the Austro-Hungarian empire as a spa, and uh, they, they sold uh, the water all over the Austrian uh, empire. And uh, especially interesting was that uh, they declared that the, the emperor himself, uh, Kaiser Franz Josef, he, he drank that water for health reasons. So we still believe in it. And it's a lot of analysis uh, around that. That's a, that's a, that's a late, the girl, the young girl there. Um, we, have, we have elections tomorrow. today, tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. So, but he's the only candidate in, in our <laughs> municipality. So he's going to be the mayor again. Yeah. So, we, if you go to the further down, you see the whole place how it is. So we're drinking the water, which is, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we gave a bottle. I mean, the back, uh, well, welcome back to everybody because the bottle is a bit cool. It's very important nowadays really hard with the water. Yeah, and, and it was, it's not a it, and, and, it, and it was so dry. The summer was so dry in Slovenia, and we, we have water running uh, in the middle of our, our property now. There, so this is the, the way we this is the Fontana we call it, and this is where we transfer um, the, the water. So it's open to everybody, everybody can come in. And, 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 and uh, we don't charge, I mean, of course, we don't charge it for anybody. They're coming from all sorts parts of Slovenia. It's unbelievable how people believe in this water. It's actually uh, got CO2 in it. So it's, uh, it's like a, when you open the bottle, you close the bottle open, it comes shh. It's natural CO2 in it. You don't have to put extra CO2 in it. And it really is. I mean, people wouldn't keep coming, you know, they come with these bottles. And then the bottle becomes red because there's so much iron in it that it goes red. Thank you for that. That's really interesting discussion and also um, really good to know that. Um, very inspiring project. Um, Dr. Usha Komets joined us now. Usha, you here? Yeah. Um, I already. Yes. Yeah? Perfect. <laughs> Welcome. I already introduced you, but. Um, yeah, um, as I said before, uh, uh, Usha is going to talk about city forum economics and culture for architecture of public space. Welcome, Usha. Hello. All righty. Um, I'll just share this screen here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is uh, the book. Actually, yes, we published it. This is the title of our book um, with uh, Pablo Guillen, City Forum Economics and Culture for the Architecture of Public Space. And this book uh, actually uh, is about how cities occupy space. It's uh, not about architectural masterpieces, but it's about uh, how is uh, it's about the tools for reinventing city life. In the book, Hollows Two Case Studies is uh, the evolution uh, of urban form in the United States and how it stands in the sharp contrast with the evolution in, of urban form in Japan. So it shows how American cities are constrained by rules. Uh, far removed from the actually the neoliberal economic idea that is actually a con strange contradiction that the American would be far from neoliberal neoliberal economic idea of free and competitive markets. 
because they are really like fighting for the rules um, of the parkings that they need to be uh, around the shopping malls. Uh, that they, the, so state is providing many rules and that uh, actually spoils the whole thing. And then in a contrast, that is with Japanese planning that promotes competition and great, great creates greater granular vocal, walkable cities dotted with small shops and not big uh, horrible malls. And these small shops that foster variety and actually goods and services and goods and services. So this is the American example. We very well known in Slovenia and in many uh, suburban uh, like uh, European cities very well as in Australia. Uh, what is the problem of the car? It's not only pollution. Uh, it's not only sustainability, a part of thing of the pollution thing, but it's the car always occupies a space, right? Mm -hmm. And this space is very valuable. And if you provide rules that this car needs to occupy space, which they did in America, the state actually intervenes that the, each shop has to have that, that, that many parkings around them, then this makes this kind of morass and chaos around, you know, this destroys all cities, right? This is the consequence, which is well known around the BTC in Ljubljana and so on, right? And the sharp contrast, you know, for example, Tokyo, uh, and congestion can be avoided if you make, you know, uh, when when cities large and dense, and actually they didn't have enough. The the, the structure of grain granularity of Tokyo was made so that it was not possible. Although they wanted and they were building highways in the 60s, it was simply not possible to only build highways. So they need to provide they need to provide public transport. So when city is large and dense, it cannot actually work without public transport, which is currently in Australia quite going on with Sydney and so on. We want to build good public transport that will be high desirable to in Slovenia to much more to follow as well. So as a uh, um, consequence, uh, yes, we have to be aware that parking is a private good. Who would like to have, I don't know, who allows to have a piano parked in front of their house? It's forbidden, right? To have just pianos around and they are much more beautiful than cars to have them in front of their buildings. Uh, so, so it should not be neither, you know, allowed to have a, a, a car, like it's a private good, it's, so you should pay for it. And that's what they did in, in Japan. So if you buy, a if you have a car, you need to have actually a parking purchase and that makes everything in life more uh, expensive and more less desirable to have a car. So nowadays, young people in Tokyo just don't want to have cars anymore. They're just old blokes who have cars, but they, the young people don't want to have them anymore. It's not cool and fashionable to have them. So, uh, and make it difficult, you know, to park. That's what they did, you know, and then that's all what they did in Japan. And then, you know, as a consequence, you know, um, that kind of, we want to be more like Tokyo, I say, you know, it's not, I was looking in Europe, in Copenhagen, in Barcelona, all around. They didn't have that smart rules that were this, make difficult to park, you know, people, and that will make and change the city for good, make, provide good public transport, and then also um, provide, um, uh, yeah, uh, provide people with um, interesting, and then as a consequence, the city uh, pop-ups, you know, with that kind of, you know, interesting book-ups, uh, street facades, you know, that that is a variety of all kinds of usages that are actually, um, you know, what people want, actually. So uh, we want to be more like Tokyo, right? It's the largest metropolitan region in the world, about 40 millions, but density is like Sydney's inner west. So, and if you see, there are almost no star, more, this is CBD, right? And there are no more cars in the streets, you know, the most streets. And actually there are many also bicycles as well around and it's less dense than Rome. It's not that dense actually, it's less dense than Rome, but traffic is only a fraction of Rome or Sydney. Here, the whole street is a footpath, you know? So cars are allowed to drive through, but not park. You're not allowed to park. Parking is very expensive, that's the thing. You have to pay, pay, pay a lot for the parking. So then people don't want to do it. Parking is only provided to be for the by the private sector, right? So it's very actually cruelly capitalistic, but it works for the people, right? It works because it promotes pedestrians. So, um, so there is this alternative of the of the um, uh, public parks for the, the public, um, yeah, good uh, public transport is actually what it's changed is everything forever, right? The frame of uh, transport. Okay, so. We know this story, right? What happened that we have more and more cities that are more and more bigger uh, and the urban areas that are actually growing. This is a, the share of urban population in the world is increasing very fast and more and more. And this is actually an old slide. And we are in a very, very fascinating, you know, fascinating moment, you know, in the history where 
it's a very special time indeed. Cities are growing because you know of many changes, and uh, they offer choice, and they offer sex, and they offer technology, and they offer interesting life. And recognizing that urban planning is now on a front line response to all everything that goes to climate with climate change discussions we focus on sustainable cities and transport green buildings and resilient infrastructure goes in hand in hand with the cities you know the cities are more and more important so and they are shaped by technology and culture you know technology is what what is possible and culture is maybe what is possible determines how to things how to make things and what can be done so people go to the cities because more things are possible right and uh, culture is what we maybe want, right? What we, we our taste, right? What, what people want to have, right? This is culture. So as we know, it was not, culture largely depends on education. And of course, gays, question of gays can marry or not. It's a cultural question that has changed over time. And now we would agree that may, may, maybe, maybe that gays can marry, right? Which our grandparents maybe would not think so. So that's the best things that our cities are shaped by. And they are cities are here to stay. So how to sort out the city, how to manage them is one of the crucial things that will actually shape the, the world of tomorrow, I believe. And the modern and large increasingly dense metropolis cannot rely mostly on private automobiles anymore because as we said, cars take much too much space and mobility has to be progressively based more on public transport and walking. So the only alternative is congestion and stagnation, which we don't want. And this is uh, actually the center of Australia. If you don't know, this is Canberra. And uh, sadly enough, you know, these uh, cars make too, make too much space. And Canberra also is, was designed for car. It's changing as well, but slowly, because it was designed in the 50s, 60s, that it was when it was being built, not designed. It was designed in the um, 1920s uh, by Griffiths. But when it was built, it was the ruler of the car. And it is all like, sadly, like looking like this from the sky but it will go for good. So this is American model, right? Car bake city, which is close, socially exclusive city. City based in car stops uh, growing because uh, of the congestion, as we said. It's not working, it's not sustainable, it's a waste of resources and it's uh, not good socially, it's not look ecologically as we know. And then on the other side, you know, this was an old, you know, this is a Unter den Linden Berlin center in the 1910, very global cities. You see the Kodak shop here, you know, in the 1910. It's already quite global and public transport is based is based city, you know, it's very open, socially inclusive city where people meet and, and have fun. So maybe we have to revert a little bit sometimes to the past. I'm not nostalgic of these beautiful chairs, but maybe I am even. So we must adapt to the needs of the new metropolis, focusing on the new building type typologies and especially on the changing nature of public space that now has to focus on serving pedestrians. So public space is critical to the new metropolis and has to be delivered with utter concern for practicality, livability, and beauty. So I was wondering, is that, um, like, did I use my time, Kaya, or shall I go on? Do I, is that it what we want, you wanted? To um, do you still have much more to say? Okay, so I just want we can to give you a few more minutes. <laughs> for a minute. Okay, then I go a little bit, a few more minutes on. So this, uh, to wrap it up, you know, this detached house, you know, which horribly actually destroyed, you know, firstly America, but it spread out all around Europe and around the world, you know, of the detached house, the type is not relevant anymore. Uh, it was the dream of people, right, to have their own uh, beautiful house. Uh, yeah, it appears in the movies in the 50s, 60s, and so on. It's not actually. You don't have to be an architect to build any such a house. Scroll is all about private. There is no public space in this model. And the relevant question is, can city exist without public space? Uh, I think no, no, I don't think this is a city. This model is in big crisis. It's very inefficient and in kind to work. So it's, uh, this is faced with sameness and mediocrity. And it has no, these big, big mansions are no good life. You know, All people spend all their lives only commuting there to somewhere. Um, yeah, to escape this uh, more as, you know, uh, life of this. So many of my, you might think that this is scarily dense. You've probably been here, this is Barcelona, but remember you loved it. And when you go together closer here, together with Paris is the densest cities in the Western world. It's mixed use, that's the fun of it. You go here and the most interesting thing here is public space, you know? So do you think if um, you, um, you think that, um, 
where is public space? You don't see many parks, right? Because the streets themselves are the important public space themselves. And I think street is the most important public space by itself. And architecture in the next city, in this is Grand, Grand Avenue in, um, you know, Champla Gran Via in Barcelona. Streets are important. Trees are important as well, you know. Streets is more, trees are much more important than grass, of course. They give shade and they would absorb noise as well and so on. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. So um, I'll have to just block this. So, and then we have, you know, all kinds of restrictions that architects have to work within with if this quite boring uh, uh, model of a champla, which is quite squarish and boring, but you see Gaudi worked within and make a big holes within it. And he was creative and he was, you know, you can do big architecture and good architecture within quite boring uh, urban framework. That's my point, you know, six floors of plan, you know, everything he was following, all the important, um, uh, follows big architects, quite crazy architects, could follow and make it happen. So that that is it. <laughs> All right. So this is a transformation of um, you know you know of a camera kind of uh, city point of view. You have to occupy the space and and put you know uh, don't eat all public uh, uh, public um, uh, street by uh, public space by cars. You know by parking the cars, you need to you know be more generous and and use it and make a kind of more beautiful things than that in, in your planning and your life. So that's pretty much it. So this is not Canberra, this is Rome now. This was Canberra here and this is Rome. And Rome is not better regarding parking. You know, Rome is very car dependent. This has, Rome has their own problems. Uh, yeah, with archeological sites and though they didn't allow them to submit, uh, to, um, to develop good public transport uh, underground. Many problems, but still it's charming Rome, but it's not, you know, it's being all parked around. So we must not need a need to adapt to this new metropolis, you know, and focus on different deep, deep building typologies and architecture of transport, plazas, shops, and public services, schools, hospital, carriage should be built around transportation nodes with good pedestrian access, you know, and that will be fun of the future life, I think. Apartment buildings should be integrated in the fabric of the cities and mixed use commercial is needed in the lower level. So that would look like this and that would make fun of the architecture of public space. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing now. I think I have eaten enough euro space. Thank you, uh, Usha, for this um, presentation. Um, very interesting. Um, now we have scheduled a light lunch and um, during this lunch, it will be a Zoom online networking with UTIS, Association of Slovenians Educators Abroad, uh, which will be moderated with Mr. Vid Chibay. Um, so I'm not sure if he's there yet. Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Um, let me start by uh, congratulating the SAAA for organizing this uh, wonderful event, sixth edition. It's becoming a great tradition, and as uh, partners, we are very proud to be uh, to be part of this. I'd uh, like to thank you all for uh, participating and for presenting and helping us celebrate Slovenian science and culture today. Uh, my name is Vichibe. I am tuning in from uh, New York City. I uh, represent Drusto Utis, the uh, Association of Slovenians Educated Abroad. And uh, we are committed to sharing ideas and knowledge by connecting Slovenia and the world. We are the leading community for uh, circulating the knowledge in Slovenia. We have over 2,200 uh, members. Um, so if you're interested in joining our mission, please please visit our, our website, drustoutis.si. Um, Today is a great example of uh, what we stand for and what we strive to do, events and activities that help showcase scientific breakthroughs and demonstrate thought leadership, where we can listen and learn from, from each other and uh, potentially to channel some of, the, some of the ideas and energy from abroad and overseas uh, back to Slovenia to make it an even, even greater place. Uh, but equally important is uh, building and strengthening the community of Slovenians and friends of Slovenia. And that's what this next uh, 45 minutes or so is about. So it's about 
networking and strengthening the, the community. Uh, we believe that uh, the community is making us stronger. The progress and innovation usually do not come out of curiosity and genius of a single person, uh, but rather it grows out of sharing and augmenting our ideas and, and work so that we can stand on each other's uh, shoulder. Um, so um, for those of you who are online, um, we will be, um, you know, so we have a networking session. Um, I would like to ask everybody that is participating to turn on their cameras. And um, what we will do is we're gonna have initially a roll call. So I would like everybody to speak up and present themselves uh, say, state your name, where are you from, and, um, and what do you do? And then what we'll do is we're going to break into several smaller rooms so that we can have better uh, conversations and get to know each other a little bit better. And uh, so we will have, and then we'll rotate this uh, breakout room so that we can, uh, we can, we, everybody has a chance to uh, to uh, really connect and, and chat with, uh, with each other. Um, so without further ado, so um, I would like to ask, uh, so I'll first I'll start myself. So my name is Vichibe, I'm from, from New York. I am an entrepreneur. I used, I, I used to be a lawyer, but now I make uh, games for, for fashion industry. Um, so, the next, so I would like to call on uh, Miss, Miss, Mrs. Uh, Sylvia. Um, so if you could, if you could, if you could do like a, like a short introduction of, of yourself and then nominate the next person to introduce themselves. Okay, fine. Uh, my name is Sylvia Zeely or Sylvia Gelet. Uh, I'm living in Melbourne. I'm a qualified teacher, but I spent 15 years in Slovenia also teaching English. And here in Australia, I'm Nati qualified with a stamp to translate from Slovenian into English. So I work as a translator and a teacher and a proofreader. And I hand over to, um, oh, <laughs> Mr. Ham, please. Hello. Uh, so um, I am new ambassador of Slovenia here in Australia. I am a career diplomat. And for most of my career, I have, I have been serving abroad in Geneva, Paris, and Turkey. And now I came to Australia. I'm looking forward to staying here for the next four years. Thank you. Um, and who would you like to uh, sign next? Well, Ms. Dan, it's a sign. Uh -huh. Hello, thank you. My name is Danica Shane. Um, I live in southwestern Sydney. My background is I'm a qualified science teacher, but at the moment I have my own tutoring business where I tutor children in, in English and maths. In the past, I've also been a, a teacher of Slovenian here in Sydney, and I have also taught English with, um, with Berlitz in Ljubljana. Oh, okay. And I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Neil Churches. Thank you, Daniha. Um, my name is Neil Churches. I have had a career in event management and the IT business for about 30 years. And now I run adventure tours. Until the pandemic, I was running adventure tours in Slovenia. And I hope to run adventure tours again there uh, from next year onwards. Um, and I nominate Mark Kernoy next. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Mike Cernoy. Uh, my background has been IT. I've been in IT for a very long time. Uh, I've uh, Merge banks together. Uh, I've uh, 
I've, trans, I've transformed uh, government agencies. I work for myself as a consultant. I have two people that, that work for me. It's a very small consultancy firm. And uh, yeah, definitely it's something, uh, I suppose my next step is, is working uh, offshore a bit more. I've done, it, I've done a bit in the past. I, I've got family in New York as well. Um, and uh, well, and that now they've recently moved and they're at Rochester right now. I don't know why, but uh, they're there. And I will nominate uh, a fellow New South Wales person is Matea. Mike, I could have bet on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Matthias Budnik. Um, I am Slovene born. Um, I had the uh, challenge and, and pleasure to live in uh, and be educated in both Slovenia and Australia most of my life. Um, uh, my industry that I mostly worked in is law, um, uh, predominantly in workers' compensation space. Um, and public liability space for over 15 years. I've also, uh, Danica, worked uh, at uh, Burley's Language School <laughs> in Ljubljana. Yeah, well, there yeah, you yeah, go, yeah. there you go. We say that. <laughs> it's, it's the place for Australians <laughs> to really teach English. A, that's right, there's been a few of us from Australia that work there, no, this no yeah. as well, of this one. Um, um, and then I later, um, in, uh, I suppose, also had a private school in Slovenia where I taught uh, uh, English. Um, when I returned to Australia, I'm back in the legal industry. Uh, I uh, recently completed my, which is also where my undergrad studies are, uh, uh, recently uh, completed my master's uh, in international relations with Sydney University, uh, where the SAAA Court Conference was also held. Uh, and, uh, a few years ago, um, and uh, now I've also worked at, at the embassy for a period of time, and I'm recently back, I chair the Slovenia Australian Chamber of Commerce, I had been previously involved with SAAA as secretary as well, and New South Wales coordinator, uh, so that's a little bit about me, so I'll stop there and I'll pass it on to uh, Manso Grisic, <laughs> thank you. Hvala, Mateja. Uh, ja, um, moje ime je Mansal Grizek. Uh, v Australiji sem zdaj deset let. Mo, moj background je... Uh, do we speak in English or Slovenian? Um, Manca, yeah, if I, could, if I could ask you to speak in English. I'm um, not sure English. if all the participants okay. can... Yeah. Uh, can uh, are, are very fluent I've, in Slovenian. I actually... I don't even, I wasn't even aware. Oh, does the people speaking English or Slovenian? <laughs> Very uh, weird. Yeah, my my background is in uh, multimedia design, fashion design and IT. Uh, I did a couple of degrees in here in Australia and I'm just finishing, hopefully just finishing my PhD at the Deakin University, which is uh, at their virtual reality lab. So I'm, my PhD, my research is in virtual reality uh, and especially specializing in this different uh, interaction possibilities within this new virtual environment. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's about it. Thank you. Uh, who should I nominate? Let's see. Um, I, Bostian. Bostian Kobe. Not there. Uh, then I'll go with P Peter Orel. Peter Orel. No, not there. What should I do? The third one. Um, Nika, do you wanna do you wanna go next? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. I am Nika, and I work in the Drustvo Tis office. Uh, I'm calling from Slovenia. It's six thirty here. 
So I woke up in the middle of the night to join to you. And it's my first time in Australia. <laughs> I had no idea you had different time zones. <laughs> that was a real re revelation for me. <laughs> anyway, I work for um, Association of Thieves. I write emails and <laughs> operate on Slack. So if you need anything, you can uh, contact us on our email and you will get me. Uh, otherwise, I'm also a music editor on our national radio, Slovenian radio, and um, I do folk music. So Sylvia, I noticed you have an Auba in, in the background, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also do the radio show called Slovenska Zemlja u pesmi in besedi. Oh, you have a guitar mic. So yeah, I, I do this uh, radio show um, for uh, folk music. So if anyone is interested in the listening, uh, you can um, you can search for it on um, Google <laughs> on the radio's uh, website. Uh, otherwise, um, well, nothing today. I'm here to support this conference with uh, Zoom and everything that we'll need. And now I nominate uh, Bustian Bugaric. He was trying to connect for a few times now. I hope he's in. Bustian, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, maybe you came a bit uh, late. We are just uh, uh, presenting ourselves. Uh, OK. Um... Yes, uh, I, I just a second. I had um, I had some problems with Zoom link, so I just uh, I just arrived. Uh, I'm very glad to be part to listen uh, to the um, to the conference, and uh, especially, of course, uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation of Maria Tsaputert, my dear friend. Uh, and the project of uh, Sydney Biennale. Now you can nominate another person, but I think we, maybe Ursha, Ursha and Srichko are the ones that didn't present themselves yet, right? You're muted a bit. Yeah. We did. We did learn quite a lot about uh, Srečko since he was a, a presenter. But um, I would suggest then, you know, if um, if I think everybody had a had a chance to um, to introduce themselves. So what I would do, given the number of people, I would break us into two rooms, um, and then we'll switch in fifteen or twenty minutes or so. So. That just gives you a chance to like get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so um, we can have a, a more meaningful conversation without moderation. Um, so I will, I will, so it's going to be a Zoom magic, right? So there's going to be a Zoom um, algorithm that is going to assign us to different rooms. Um, and um, yeah, I'll see you either in the room or when we return in about 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, thank you.
All right, uh, welcome back, everyone. So we will do one more uh, <coughs> breakout session um, for another 10 or 15 minutes or so. So um, hopefully, just you know, the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, because uh, the, the schedule uh, goes on. Yeah. The program. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so hopefully the algorithm is going to do a good job. So we're going to get a good mix of, of, of people, but I'm sure there's going to be some, some overlap.
Okay, so now we're uh, we're all back. I would like to uh, thank you, everybody that participating in the the breakout session. Um, I know we've been a little short on time, but um, hopefully at least have most of us had a chance to uh, to introduce ourselves to uh, to each other. But I will hand it over to the organizers now in uh, in Perth. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. I hope you guys enjoyed the um, networking. Um, we're going to continue now with Mr. Neil Churches. Not sure if he joined us. Yeah, he yes. is here. I can see him. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce you. Um, uh, Neil uh, grew up in Sydney, Australia, and his father was Ralph Churches, um, the Crow, the leader of the Greatest Escape. Um, after a childhood that incompressibly involved eating Balkan food and listening to Slovenian chore recordings, he um, encouraged his father to write a memoir, A Hundred Miles as the Crow Flies. Um, Neil has spent several decades working in various industries, including tourism, event management, theater, marketing, publishing, and consulting and training in IT. And he's going to speak today um, about The Greatest Escape, a bubble of luck floating down the Freedom Corridor. The word is yours. Okay, now can you see my screen? See your handsome face from this side. Can you see a PowerPoint screen? No. Um, if you click at the bottom, it says share screen, and then it's going to be pop up a little, and you can pick which screen you're going to share. Okay. I thought I had done that, but obviously not. Let's try again. Okay. Uh, did it, did it, okay, hold on. I was asking. You me. have to, yeah, you have to pick this, which screen you're going to. Once yeah. you share the screen. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. And okay, and go share screen. There we go. All right. How's that? That is working. Excellent. Yes. Good. All right. Well, um, thanks very much for inviting me to participate. Um, I acknowledge the traditional. Aboriginal custodians of country throughout Victoria, where I currently reside, and their ongoing connection to the land and waters. I pay my respect to their culture and their elders, past, present, and emerging. So this um, is a story of Slovenia and Australia and the United Kingdom. Um, it's a story of my family and families that I've got to know in Slovenia. And for my family, it begins in the poorest state of Australia, and that is South Australia, um, the home of the Crow Eaters, so called because we are so poor that the only thing that we can eat is crows, apparently. Um, in the Murray Mallee, a semi-arid region near the border with Victoria is Kalkami. And that in 1917 is where my father was born, and he is the smallest child on the left there. In 1934, he got off the farm and he would won a scholarship to high school and uh, matriculated, but was too poor to actually go to university. So he worked as a bank clerk because he was, even though he was a conservative by nature, he was also a passionate anti-fascist. He hated everything that Hitler and Mussolini stand for, stood for. So he signed up for the army and that's his mugshot for joining the army. And June 1940 and in 1940, uh, November 1940, he was qualified because of his education as a map reader and headed off to North Africa. So in North Africa, he um, did basic training in Palestine, was then moved to army headquarters at Mirza Matru and then did long range mapping in Libya. Then was shipped to Alexandria and then to Athens and was part of the Greek campaign where he was captured by the Germans and put on a train to Thessaloniki and where he spent a lot of time in some very bad prisoner of war camps. 
for about two months and then on a train to a place that he'd never heard of, Marabo. And in Marabo, where he got off here at the train, the old custom shed, uh, the Zollschuppenlager, and that was Starlag 18D. Now, um, he didn't know that there was a resistance movement beginning to organize against the German and Italian occupation. He didn't know anything about um, a bunch of people called the Partisans. Um, but as an ordinary soldier, just a private, he had to go out to work for the Germans. Very low wages, and he had no choice where he was sent. So he didn't know anything about how Slovenia had been broken up by uh, and split between the Italians and the Germans. All he knew was that he was sent by rail, first of all to Russia, then across to Russia under Weinstrasse, then Ehrenhausen, and finally Chantil. He was determined to escape and he began to teach himself German. And sometimes in some, some camps, some of these work camps would help. And in other places, things were very, very bad. And because he got desperate and cold and exhausted, he tried to escape, but he didn't plan it particularly well. He, both times he tried to escape, he was quickly recaptured and he was put in a punishment camp in Maribor. Um, and there he witnessed some of the murders of the, one of the first Nazi extermination camps that was set up, not just for undesirables in the German Reich, but specifically for Soviet prisoners of war. And he witnessed as part of his punishment, some of the murders of the 5,000 Soviet prisoners that died in that building on the outskirts of Maribor. Luckily, in April 42, he was sent up the railway to Chantilly. And from April 1942 to September 1943, he graduated as he got better and better German from Übersetzer, translator, to a Traunsmann, shop steward, the chief negotiator with the Germans on behalf of the camp for all the people who are working at uh, Chantilly, rebuilding the road. October 1943, they were transferred to Marbo because the work camp was now instructed to rebuild uh, the railway or rebalance the railway between Maribor and Klagenfurt. So they got on a train every day from Maribor and um, went down the Drava. He, these are pictures of um, life in the camp that Dad had organized as camp leader. What he didn't know was that um, the British were very interested in what the resistance movement in Slovenia was doing and sent in a number of people in the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, um, and the second um, person to arrive in June 1944 was Major Frank Lindsay. He found out that um, the prisoner of war camp in Maribor was actually uh, due for to be a bombing um, target for the Americans because it was a major railway center and that all the prisoners there were going to be um, killed if the bombing went ahead. So he decided to organize a rescue. He talked to the special operations executive in London and they agreed to send in a special uh, operative called Major Losco to help make this rescue happen. So the trouble was they had no way of getting in contact with the prisoners. They, they were based in Rogla, the, the, uh, the SOE operations were based in Rogla and they were shortly going to be moving to Lawrence na Pohoyu. The prisoners were based in Maribor, but they caught the train every day to Arjbalt. There was no way of getting in contact unless they actually found a way of getting the prisoners trust. Luckily, the prisoners were also looking for a way to get out. Um, this is my father. Um, Les Laws was his deputy um, on-site translator. And that was my father. Both of these glamour shots were taken in Maribor um, as part using part of their wages. They'd been earning to send pictures back to their loved ones to say that they're okay. Les Laws was the translator on the work site, and he'd been getting to know some of the locals and was cautiously asking about how to get in contact with the partisans because 
um, they thought that the partisans were possibly their best bet to get away. Uh, one of these locals, uh, Lisa Zavodnik, introduced Liz to a partisan agent and the plan to escape began to be organized at the camp end um, between Liz and Ralph um, to how to organize the whole camp to get away to meet the partisans at the particular point that they agreed on, which was at Oshbolt. So on August the 29th, 1944, the um, Liz and Ralph and five others agreed, uh, met the partisans at the agreed point only to be told that the mass escape is off and that they should uh, that they should just come with the partisan agent anyway. The reason the mass escape was off was because Major Losco had not actually been parachuted in yet, and it was decided the whole affair was too risky. So they made the journey to Lovrance, where there was a big uh, recruitment campaign going on and a bit of a party, a bit of alcohol, and dead after uh, drinking a fair amount of alcohol, got some um, rather reckless and went and talked to the partisan commanders and um, said that uh, there were going to be another 100 people at the railway the following day. Uh, bugger the British, why don't we just do the escape anyway? And um, after some consideration, that was the agreed plan. So at... Um, Dawn on August the 30th, 1944, the train delivering the prisoners dropped them off and went back to Maribor, and the partisans captured the guards, the German subcontractors, and the remaining um, 83 prisoners, or um, um, eight, sorry, 93 prisoners. Um, they headed into the hills, walking at night, and I apologize, Neil. I'll just have to remind you that we're running a little bit out of time. So maybe okay. a minute, a minute, okay. and then, yeah, if you can. Yeah. So <laughs> Thank you. They, I apologize. They walked, they walked, they got ambushed, and they eventually got to Gornigrad, where they were actually um, probably the most photographed escape um, in uh, World War II. The partisans saw this as great propaganda value, lots of publicity photos. They were heading for Nadlesk Airfield, RAF Piccadilly Club. However, the Germans discovered it and raided it. And so they had to change plans and head to Semich. So in Semich, September 18th, 1944, they were all flown out by six um, planes from uh, down near Semich to Bari. A hundred were flown to freedom, nine New Zealanders, 12 Australians, 20 French, 59 British. It really was the greatest escape. There you go. Well done, great. That was really, just really, great. yeah. I think everyone's amazed. By the, <laughs> very interesting, thank you so much. My pleasure, Thanks for thank sharing. you for the invitation. Thank you again. Um, next one, we have um, our keynote professor, Maria Tiza um, who's an artist and architect. Um, she is based in Ljubljana um, and her work emphasizes individual and community empowerment, problem solving tools and st strategies um, for the future that transcends the neoliberal agreement and testifies to the failure of modernism. Um, she exhibited, exhibited extensively through Europe and Americas, and she created a, a, she had a project uh, that was um, a, an installation uh, that centered on river rights um, in, on the 23rd Biennale of Sydney in 2022. Hi, Maria Tiza. Welcome. Hi. Nice to meet um, you. So, um, and um, yeah, we're interested um, what you're going to share with us. Well, greetings to, to everyone at the table and beyond, friends who joined online. Um, today, uh, I will talk about my project uh, for the 23rd Sydney Biennale, 
which was exhibited at the MCA Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney this spring, like 2022. I will walk you through the exhibition. In addition, we will also show you a cut from sharing the Lachlan River film. But just a few words how it all began. I was invited to participate by Jose Roca, the artistic director and co-curator of the biennial. He is familiar with my water projects, and needless to say, I was super happy to receive the invitation, especially because the biennial was focused on rivers. And for your information, the exhibition, exhibition actually a part of the AMCA presentation will be on view at the Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane early next year in springtime. Uh, but let's start with the first slide. Um, on the board, uh, you see names of participants of the Biennale printed out on the right side. The project I will talk about is presented here as a collaboration between two co-authors, Marietti Zaputoc with Ray Woods, with Uncle Ray Woods. Collaboration with Ray Woods, an elder of the Viragiri First Nation, was for me an amazing and priceless experience. We are both concerned about the rights of nature, which you may say is a global concern, but we speak from local perspectives. Today, I will talk about the struggles of two rivers in two parts of the world, the Socha River in Slovenia and the Lachlan River in New South Wales. Next slide, please. Uh, Before, okay, uh, do you see the slide? It's not moving, it's the first slide still. Okay. I don't know. Uh, Nika, can you move the slide? Well, can you I move the slides? Yeah. No. Nika moves the slides. Well, his mother gave them to me yesterday when I was over. You are still seeing the first slide? Yes, yes. I'm seeing the first slide, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let it's not just, even. Oh, yeah. Let me just do it again. Better? There we go. Yeah. yeah. That's better. yeah. Um, okay, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Nika. Uh, but before I go into the Two Rivers project, I will say a few words about the house in the photo you see here. It was a centerpiece of the installation. This is the house of the agreement between humans and the earth. It is constructed from local wood and held together by fiber rope. By using the rope to construct the house, we translated the fragility of coexistence between people and nature into the construction process. And uh, also important, the drawings on wood present agreements between people and nature. Next slide. Um, now uh, to, the to the Socha River drawings, uh, the mural uh, is titled The Time of Humans on the Socha River and it shows a river as a tree of life. The drawing brings together two generations of caretakers of the Socha River in Slovenia, the followers of natural religion who were still active in the Socha River Valley as late as the 1970s. And uh, you can think about it, this is only 50 years ago in the middle of Europe. And uh, of course, today's environmentalists. Both the followers of natural religion, and this is the closest we get to indigenous knowledge, and environmentalists are guardians of the rights of nature. I'm talking here about the common good of people and of nature together. Next slide. The, the Rights of a River is a visual essay, a set of 10 drawings, a story to read. 
the narrative moves from the 2016 constitutional amendment, which made access to drinkable water a fundamental right in Slovenia, to the successful referendum a year ago called by the civil society. The referendum overturned a new law that would have changed the country's rivers and coastline from protected natural resource to an endangered resource. Next. Social river is presented here as a living being with its own agency, such as her duty to safeguard water for future generations. And, uh, and again, this is the stand of environmentalists as well, who, by the way, call for removal of existing dams on the river so that the river could renew itself. Next, please. By voting for water in the referendum, Slovenian citizens changed their relationship with nature. They transformed themselves from owners to caretakers. In the, in the eye of a caretaker, a river is not an object, but a subject. A right to water opened the way to the larger issue of the rights of nature. Next slide. The idea of water in a glass, an object I can use, transformed itself into a river as a person. You can even say a family member. In a family, I'm not an owner of my children. I am their caretaker. The referendum was a tool to change the idea of ownership to the larger idea of sharing the responsibility for nature together with nature. Uh, this is how we move away from a human-centered position. We don't control a river, you can think of a dam, or instead we work together with a river. For instance, let it meander and flood for the benefit of the country and those inhabiting it. Water becomes a river, a body, an independent and indivisible entity, a body not unlike the bodies we inhabit. A river is a living being concerned about its living conditions, no less that we are about ours. The position is similar to how indigenous people understand their relationship with nature. Next slide. Which brings me uh, to the Lachlan River in New South Wales and to the collaboration with Ray Woods, an elder of the Viradjuri First Nation, who together with his people see himself as a caretaker of Lachlan River and the country. Viradjuri country is under threat from a loss of water due to the competition from irrigation, mines, other upstream, upstream users, and the proposed raising of the Viangala Dam wall. In the slide on the right, you see the first page of a transcript that documents Ray's appearance before a committee of the Parliament of New South Wales where he presented arguments against the enlargement of the Viangala Dam on Lachlan River, which would irreversibly damage the river and consequently life along the river. At this point, I want to say that Ray, his collaborator Bernard and I had numerous conversations on Zoom, of course, and we became friends over common concerns and hopes. We started to trust each other. For me personally, it was, a, uh, it, it was uh, wonderful to see that we spoke, if I can say so, the same language. We exchanged our experiences, we listened to each other. We agreed on most of the issues from ethical to political, even if we were located on the opposite sides of the planet. I'm hopeful to see that indigenous people and environmentalists stand for the same knowledge raising awareness about the common good of the world. It gives me hope for the future we aspire to, for the future inhabited by our, our children and the next seven generations that Ray is talking about. Next slide. Uh, here is the mural, The Time on the Lachlan River. I translated the care for the Lachlan River, the fights for the rights of the river, and the issues that we were that were raised along the way into this mural, 
the central image is a tree whose branches are filled with lakes, trees, birds, and people. But let me read you a line from the text at the bottom of the mural. Part of it is in Ray Wood's words. The Ray's dam takes away the water, but it does not give it back to the living world on the river's lower end. Sharing the river means responding to each another's needs. It means sharing with everyone and everything. Next slide. And now I want to show two drawings from the visual essay, The Life on the Lachlan River. The drawings gives a voice to the living world along the Lachlan River, including a black swan, a tree, the river itself, mother nature, the Wiradjuri people, and settlers. Here, the tree is simply saying he is thirsty. Next slide. Mother Nature speaks about the emotions between the river and her caretakers, the idea of the family and sharing. Next slide. During last days of the Biennale, we received the news that the enlargement of the Viangala Dam was stopped. Uh, we, were, we are proud to participate in raising awareness about Lachlan River country and its struggles. Uh, so the film, Sharing of the Lachlan River, which we will show you in a minute, was part of the installation at the MCA. It is a film by Uncle Ray Woods and Bernard Sullivan. Let's look at the cut from the film. It is narrated by Ray Woods speaking from the heart about the need of country. And now I will <clears throat> now give the word to Ray Woods. Yurdu Morang, Yundu, Yurai, Marangan, Yuradri, Yundu, Buddha, Yuradri, Gibi. So I'm just saying good day. My name is Ray Woods. My Yuradri name, Yuradri name is Bujan, and I'm a Yuradri Gibi. Eurajri man, and I've got a story to tell. I've been given knowledge, and with knowledge comes a huge responsibility by my elders, my old people, about looking after country and looking after our river systems. It sits heavily with me, and I make sure that it's done in a, in a manner that's appropriate and in our Eurajri values and a way of living. And that was a holistic way of living under Yinjimara. Now Yinjimara means so much. It's uh, more than a word of respect. It's about being courteous, being honourable, and understanding and, and managing and, and learning to, be go, to go slow and to take things slow. Yinjimara was given to us and passed on as a way of living and a holistic way of living to our people. And we were taught this by our mothers and our, and our grandmothers. These are the values we're taught at an early age. So we're taught from babies onwards about Yinjimara and how to, how to behave, how to act and our responsibilities and our values. <laughs> Later on, as, as, yeah, as we become older fellas, we start be turning into uh, young, young adults. Our men then take over and, and teach us about our country and how to look after country. So our waterways, our rivers, our river systems are a major part of that country. Our men were given that responsibility of looking after these waterways. The uh, bird life um, that, uh, that is attracted to this area when uh, it's got water in it. It's, it's the, um, 
as you can see from the background here it's visually it's a it's a paradise uh, especially out here there's in a predominantly dry area where uh, these little uh, pockets of, of water are so far few between um, you know with water being taken away from these areas uh, we can see around the edges of this lake here where the uh, the trees have uh, suffered and died off as it is um, and it's an important part, place to, to maintain and look after for not only us but for, for everything else. We're here on the edge of Dry Lake. I look at these trees, beautiful old box trees, you know, they could be 800 years old. They've been here for lifetime after lifetime of people um, and they're here crying. This one here was a, you know, um, probably it was every couple of years the got water. Now as we said that's now going out to every 15 years. Far too long for, for these trees to go without water. This here is the, the north side of the Belogal or Belugal, one of the, one of the uh, great breeding areas for all sorts of birds. There's the amount of different uh, water birds and that they, they found nesting and uh, enjoying this, this water, this lake here when it was, it was full, was amazing, how the, the amount of different bird life that was on it. Now, this here hasn't had, had water, I'd say that would have been 2016 that it would have last had water. Every three years it should be, uh, are now extending out you know, to six, seven, and some of these places out here, some of them haven't been had water for 15 years, so the uh, country down here gets forgotten. You know, we've had, a, had a, a great rainfall in the catchment area, which would have, um, in, a, in, a, in a normal year without, uh, dams and weirs, all this here would have been flooded. This system can be regulated in a way where it's shared still. We're not going to go back. We can't, we can't go back with the infrastructure that they've put in place. We can't go back to what Mother intended it to be. But we can go close and we can regulate <laughs> it, look after it a bit better and share that water. Some of these systems that could probably get water one year sharing it around and then the next year give it to another part of the system uh, down the lower end here. So it all eventually gets a, within those years, gets a, gets a drink. We don't need to, to be building extensions to the wall. Let's manage what we've got a lot better than what we have. We can, uh, we can change things, you know, that's what we can do. We can make a change and it all comes down to us knowing that you know, it's not lost forever. We've got to, if, we, if we don't do start doing something though, it will be lost forever. We've got to start making these decisions and making sure that this water shared and comes, comes down to these lower ends, to these, these, dam, these, these lakes and these uh, swamps out here to maintain that, that ecosystem that's been here for thousands of years. We can't get it back to what it used to be and we're never ever going to get it back to what it used to be. But let's keep what we got before we lose any more. So we need to make sure that everything's got to be looked after and that's sharing for everything, you know, all the environment, for, for all the animals, for everything that's out here. We need to make sure that we're looking after it because they haven't got a voice. We're its voice. We're the ones that, are, that make sure that this country gets looked after. We are all a part of Mother. We come from her, we'll go back to her. Everyone, everyone that's here and everything. We've got to remember that we're like a grain of sand on the beach. We're all a part of it, but we all make that that beach. Every little grain makes that beach, and that's like everything else here. So we want, we, we're happy to share with the ones upstream, but hey, they've got to be happy to share with us down here too, and make sure they're looking. Because down here, we're not talking about irrigating. We're talking about looking after mother and looking after everything else around here. That's what it's about. It's not about us, it's about the country.
So I'm back. Hope you enjoyed the film. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Marisa. This was really, really, really lovely. <laughs> Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions here or online, we have a few minutes to spare for Q&A. Hi, Maria Titsa, Kaya here. Oh, hi, it's Kaya. Great to see you at least online and hope to see you in Melbourne or in Australia soon. Um, we are actually curious about maybe also of the continuation of this project. I know that when we were together in Melbourne, you had lots uh, um, of plans with Australia. So would you be able to reveal anything? Uh, sorry, what was the question? So um, as far as I know, when you were in Melbourne, you were talking a lot about uh, potential projects with Australia and also with this one, uh, what is the future of maybe this collaboration or any uh, other collaborations um, with Australia? If you can um, reveal anything. Um, yes, uh, when I was uh, invited to, to speak at the Mer Melbourne Design Week, uh, I did uh, talk with a group of uh, designers and uh, landscape engineers about the project. And, uh, but that was actually just uh, an advisor to the project and I hope they are doing well. I'm not in contact with them. But uh, the collaboration with Ray Wood was uh, indeed amazing because we did exchange everything. Uh, this is what I call the true collaboration. We worked on the text and the images together. So he would respond and, and so on. So just to tell you that the collaboration is not a project where you just comment on, on a certain situation, but you really uh, truly work together uh, to get the story together. And uh, I'm not uh, having any ideas now to come to Australia. Of course, I would love to. I love the country. I traveled all over it. And uh, also, I have some friends there now, which I'm very happy about. And Kaya, now, by the way, just thank you for sending me those images because I was not able to see the Biennale in person. So I also included your photos in my presentation. Thank you. I was actually not aware that uh, they're actually my photos. But uh, yeah, <laughs> great to see you again. Uh, anyone with any questions? Maybe online? You can put them into a chat or um, you can turn on your microphone. Maybe I, I can just say that um, it's actually the project, uh, the collaboration with Ray Woods for the 23rd of uh, Sydney Biennial actually also shows the role of contemporary art in contemporary culture. So uh, the artist, typically were not just asked uh, to be artists, but they were proclaimed in the Sydney Biennial as participants. And uh, the, 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 basically the border between art and activism and actually just being uh, a part of this living world were mer merged together during the Biennial. So I thought for those of you who have seen it, uh, I'm sure it was a fantastic experience. So um, we know you um, from a, a lot of different projects across Caracas and New York um, and uh, in Europe. Can you speak a little bit about uh, those projects and uh, if uh, any of those are um, um, going forward with uh, any other um, collaborators in the sense of, because also, Ursha Komatz was speaking about the future of the cities and sustainability of the cities. And you work a lot in that um, sense of uh, providing maybe some ideas for the future of the cities. So um, 
yeah, maybe if you can talk about um, mm -hmm. the past projects and uh, maybe the future. Um, yes. Uh, I'm cur currently working on a public art project in Stockholm in Sweden. We are working on it for already four years and it will be inaugurated next year. Uh, but this is not uh, a participatory project. I'm actually known for participatory projects. And uh, one, of, uh, one of those uh, I remember was uh, in Amsterdam, maybe now already 10 years ago, when we together with residents, we, uh, uh, we uh, created a community garden in a neighborhood that was uh, stressed where residents were poor and uh, actually just moving from one part of city to the other. So in this fragile environment, we created a community garden and uh, the residents took it over and it became somehow a, a case study for other gardens, community gardens in Amsterdam. And uh, actually the network was created and uh, this was uh, for me an important project. However, it didn't last more than, I think it lasted two or three years and then it died away. But as this is a typical for participatory projects where people take uh, projects over, the project came back uh, two years ago and now uh, in very similar um, framework, it continues to live on. So uh, just to, to tell you that we are not talking anymore about permanent projects. Everything in uh, the cities we live today is very temporary. It's also fragile. So the projects, the community-based projects are important um, place to, uh, to let's say, a laboratory that uh, communities use to, to, to formulate the ideas and to, to understand how they want to test, how they want to live in the future city on other, on other sets of issues like uh, are usually available to them. So these kinds of community-based projects, I, I think, are super important for, for testing and envisioning sustainability uh, in the future city or in the contemporary city now. Thank you. Yeah, we definitely agree with you. I think everyone here. Um, thank you for joining us and for this uh, amazing um, talk and the video. Um, we hope we're going to see more of you in that space of era. Um, next one is Mr. Alesh Berlot. Um, he's a mechanical engineer and entrepreneur who studied in Ljubljana. Um, he established um, a company, Ocean Tech in Sinitza in Slovenia in 2016, 2006 with his friends. Um, and his passion to be challenged brought him to Australia um, where he embarked on a journey of a um, number of business ventures in the last 10 years. Um, and his latest uh, one is looking into starting a business creating glamping resort in Margaret River here in Western Australia. Um, I'll give him a speech. Yeah, and he's here with us in person.
So, yeah, first, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I was uh, I was quite honored to, to be asked to speak at that kind of uh, conference. So I, I have a short slot, so I try to squeeze as much as I could in that short time, and I hope I won't be too, um, too broad. So life starts with, uh, you have to take a motion for something to change in your life. And uh, I'll start my journey after I um, graduated at the uh, Slovenian University of Mechanical Engineering. So we always dream about like big uh, stories, how we're going to be, become rich and stuff. And then the true the reality was my first job as a Saturn V engineer, low pie, wasn't happy no freedom like i it just didn't feel right and i saw the only possibility to grow in terms of like um, material prosperity was to be a manager or to have your own business um we were looking at uh, a business idea to have a boat building industry but at that time this wasn't possible because there was no no um, proper facility and to be a manager just didn't seem like possible. So I was looking at other options and then I came across SIG and I saw how much it's a part work of engineering in Australia. And then I just decided to go there also for a bit of a challenge. Um, so I quit my job at the time at the line. And uh, then when I was waiting on Australian visa, which was promised to happen in three months, I got opportunity to go on a big race, um, selling race, um, which gave me a lot of confidence in my future life because we were exposed to um, quite um, like influential people in Congo and in France. And uh, so when I came back from that race, I was completely broke um, and I needed a job. So I started at electrical service as an engineer. And then after a month and a half, uh, the manager left, so I said, yeah, I'll take, the, take this over. So electric service, like we did like three very good years in fruit production, and I was, was really happy. But during that time, their opportunity came back with a facility available in Yosinitsa, my hometown, and that's when we established Ocean Tech, uh, which is still going. Um, but you know, when you, I, when you start a process for visa and when you get it, you just, I couldn't let that um, ticket um, go away. So yes, I moved to, to Australia. I had the light most of my choice and I start from scratch. I start as a TI again. And then as an engineer, I got opportunity again to replace operations manager. So MG Engineering was the business. Um, I started with seven, workers and then there was 40 of us with seven engineers and I even hosted the uh, Minister of Defense of Australia at the time because we built this mast for uh, Australian destroyers. But I couldn't let my entrepreneur um, taste uh, and I, I always looked for opportunities. So I started business side up. This was meant to support uh, Slovenian products in Australia. Uh, one was uh, Mick Celia, which we believe that has a great opportunity, double glazing. Nothing in Australia is double glazed. So we said, oh, this is amazing. You know, 20 years of technology, they missed completely. Um, it didn't prove like that. Then um, five years later, I opened us hyperbarics because one of the Slovenian friends got reward a golden golden uh, medal in one of the medical fairs in uh, Poland. And we thought that's, that's a great thing to, to start. So we opened us hyperbarics to offer hyperbaric treatments. And after we opened um, distribution for Australia with the mother, with the mother company, Oha Hyperbarics, which is an Austrian company that Slovenian owns it. Uh, what I found, in, in that time, that there are key factors which contribute to big cultural difference, which I didn't really understand when I started those businesses. 
One is the season and the weather. I just put these two pictures to demonstrate the difference. And natural resources definitely helps Australian economy because it's there is abundance of them. And one thing like Europe and uh, uh, Slovenia is have its shortages, which Australia doesn't seem they like how many. And my, I don't want to um, offend anyone, but my key difference, what I found in culture is that Australian would choose short and instant solution before long-term solution, which requires more effort. And the cost of that is only considered at the time of the purchase, not really over its lifespan. So that's why I said, okay, all this try, my businesses didn't really blossom. But in terms of sustainability, the life in a city was never seems right. So we, we try to, to find a way to live um, more sustainable. And one of my friends has a business in Slovenia. He does glamping. And when we were looking at um, possible properties in WI, um, we found that uh, Margaret River three hectare property, which actually um, be the op that offers the option to start glamping. What glamping is, it's uh, camping in the comfort of a hotel room. I reckon it's one thing is that people needs nature to uh, disconnect and they have to go away from the busy lives in the cities. And this disconnection then gives them power to go back and, and live in the cities which are not, not our natural environment. So this is why glamping has a really, really good uh, potential. They think they predict 15% growth in next three years. This is American study. Um, you definitely need to have right location because that in hospitality is everything. The return on investment for these units and the whole setup is quite good. And 20 units in three years, if you compare to hotel room, it's big, big difference. Um, you can also start this business smaller, you don't have to go big, and you have potential for growth. And uh, there are very low maintenance, maintenance costs. Um, advantage of Lucian, this is the business in Slovenian business who does this whole solution on, uh, on glamping is that they do everything. And the one thing is they do modular construction, so it reduces work on site. It uh, reduces destruction on the nature of the site. They use screw foundations. Um, this also helps to reduce project execution time. Um, and it's built, the units are built for a much higher level of living comfort than what Australian standard is. And the uh, um, indoor um, assure a high quality of build. Um, yeah, so um, this is how to create a perfect city guide of our so like a, a quickly. And if someone has some questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions here or? Yeah, where, 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 when can we book? <laughs> so every story starts with um, its idea first, and then it takes time to execute it. So the council applications and what we have now in mind in the, at the moment won't be earlier than a year and a half before we can open, because it goes through application. like, and. It, it's learning also like how the, the government works here because the property we have, it's current through like residential. So you have to change it to, to a business. And we, we would like to separate part of the property, like one hectare only for that. So it, it goes through, through a bit of a process before well, we can start. It's not even saying that because in Slovenia, we have, to, we have to go through way more paperwork than here. Oh. <laughs> We're just through changing some OPN. It's OPN. 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 Yeah. OPN. And I'm telling you. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so. I wanted to talk about a few differences. And it's like in, in bureaucracy, there is definitely a big change. Like how you start in Slovenia and how you start. 
and Australia really is like, a, it's a good nurturing ground for businesses because to open a business here is no big deal. Everyone can do it. And, and later on you can do, you can, you know, make it go. While in Slovenia, everything has to be by the book before you can even start. I, I think it's how do you say that but, uh, by the book? I, I thought that in my time it was it, it was just predictions because my parents weren't rich and my dad was, wasn't, uh, you know, my, my mom and my dad weren't educated people. She can't do anything, you know. But here they don't judge you by that. They judge you by oh, what, yeah. you, what you do and what you can bring to the company and uh, how hard you work and how much effort you put into the, into the work. Over there it's who you know and how you know and, and um, uh, how you, how did you get the job? And, and it's way, way more political. Here it's way much more straightforward. Who mm -hmm. am I? You know, but I, I got somewhere. Slovenia. I told you before at the beginning that I still would probably work for, for one company and and probably I'll be retired by now. I know I'm 61, so I could <laughs> I could retire. But uh, but but still, you know, the the land of opportunity is in is Australia. So I think that you're you're lucky that you are doing this here because we are doing glamping in, in Slovenia right now. And I'm telling you, you know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a lucky man. So maybe we should come together and do something. <laughs> Thank you, Alesh. Um, this was really um, inspiring and good. Maybe new collaborations are in order. <laughs> um, cheap accommodation. Yeah, free accommodation. <laughs> oh, we said cheap, you said free. <laughs> You're a good negotiator. Um, next one, we have our keynote, and it's Professor Danila Turk, um, who's a president of Club de Madrid and former president of Slovenia between 2007 and 2012. Um, he's an expert on international law and human rights. He taught at the Faculty of Law University in Ljubljana, um, and he was Slovenia's ambassador at the UN and later from 2000 to 2005, UN Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs. After ending his term as a president of Slovenia, he joined the World Leadership Alliance, Club de Madrid, organization of over 100 former democratically elected presidents and prime ministers. He is currently a president of the Club de Madrid, and he, we are very, very lucky um, and honored that he is joining us today um, and what he's going to share with us. Um, welcome, Danilo. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to be here and to learn a little bit about glamping and other interesting activities. So, uh, well, we'll see how my talk <laughs> fits into the general course of discussion. Definitely will. <laughs> the word is yours. All right. Um, look, uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak at the conference uh, that has really a very interesting um, theme. I mean, uh, the, the theme that was that I was asked to address, and that is environment, sustainability, and community. And I would like to say that today, when we talk about community, uh, we should not think about something local. A community nowadays is uh, much larger. It's not even national or regional, it's global. And uh, the big problem is uh, how does one make sure that the global developments uh, you know, produce uh, positive results, produce uh, development, produce protection, produce environmental stability and sustainability uh, that can be enjoyed at all levels. Now, that's not a simple question nowadays, and it's also not a question uh, that could be deferred to the future, because uh, for reasons which we all understand, uh, the world is it, at an inflection point today. Uh, the effects of global warming are terrifying. The problems that the world has to deal with are extremely complex and large. And the question is, how does one help creating something that would be, you know, a global community really capable of solving problems and ensure sustainability for the future generations and protect the planet against degradation and destruction? So this is the, this is the problem with, with the understanding of the idea of community today. Now, today, obviously, 
these problems are extremely serious. Nobody needs to be reminded of that in particular. But nevertheless, as you know, we have a, a serious and a large scale war in Europe today, in Ukraine. Uh, this has compounded some of the problems that existed before, including the food crisis, the crisis of foreign debt, the energy crisis, all those crises existed before, but they were compounded by the developments related to the, to the war in Ukraine. And obviously the question is, what, what can the international community, again, community do about this? Now, it's interesting to read if one wants to learn about the reality of the international community, to read the declaration of the Bali uh, conference, the uh, conference of the G20, that is the heads of state of the 20th most populous and uh, economically most powerful states of the world, comprising about 60% of global population and about 80% of global product. Um, now, the, the leaders have met actually in your neighborhood, uh, in Bali, which is not all that far from Perth. I was in Bali last week for, for another conference, and of course, I had to travel a much longer distance to Bali than you would when, when, you, when you go to Bali. Um, so you are familiar with the environment in which uh, the leaders of the world met, and uh, what they produced is really um, uh, quite worrisome uh, for two reasons. First, um, the problem of uh, war in Ukraine obviously was a very important factor in the discussion. It was uh, actually determining much of, of the discussion in, in Bali, and it ended without any kind of agreement. Uh, the, uh, the participants uh, represented their own views. I mean, those views differ. Of course, the majority was strongly criticizing and actually condemning the, the Russian aggression, uh, but there was a significant number of countries which had a more careful approach uh, without condemnations, and those differences were clearly visible. Uh, they recognized them and said at the end of the paragraph three of that declaration, the following, recognizing that G20 is not the forum to resolve security issues, we acknowledge that security issues can have significant consequences for global economy. Now, this is obvious, and this was simply recognized in the statement. The question then arises, all right, I mean, given that we have a serious problem affecting global economy, how does one deal with global economy? And a few lines further, we read that, and I quote, at today's critical moment for global economy, it is essential that G20 undertakes tangible, precise, swift, and necessary actions using all available policy tools to address common challenges. Now, that looks pretty demanding. And if you read the remaining 16 pages of densely printed text of the declaration, you would learn a great deal about the complexity of tasks that the international community has to deal with. So community in the global context is something very complicated and something that, can, that cannot easily be managed. And I must say, uh, some of the issues are not really even fully understood. And let me, let me give you a, an example, which I believe that people in Australia understand very well. And that's the example of climate change as expressed through water disasters. In Australia, you have had huge floods in different parts of the country. You have had serious and long lasting droughts. And this is a reality, which of course was most dramatic in Australia, but it was dramatic in other places as well. Most recently this year in Pakistan, one third of the entire country was inundated. In Europe, we have had a summer where the a drought reached the historic levels for the last 500 years, and nothing like that was reported, and so forth. And all that is not, you know, a series of local phenomena. It's really a global pro a global phenomenon, which requires global approach, and that approach can be made possible only if the problem is properly understood, and the problem today is not properly understood. 
uh, one critical aspect of the global water crisis is first of all the lack of understanding of the global uh, water cycle as you know water is a regenerating uh, good it 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 uh, you know it it takes different forms but it's regenerating itself in a cycle but that cycle has different um, expressions in different parts of the world and um, a certain type of um, uh, phenomena in one part can have a serious effect on other parts of the world. So uh, the question is how to deal with them globally. Do we understand what is happening with the global water cycle? How, for example, the uh, destruction of rainforest in Brazil affects the, um, poor, the, the precipitations in Nigeria or in Pakistan. And there, there is a link there. And of course, it is understood that such a link exists. But how it works? What really is? Uh, what, what do we know about how it works? Anyway, um, the question of the global water cycle has been discussed for a number of years and the international community has not yet developed a system of uh, analysis that would allow a good understanding of what is happening. Right now, an example of what is being tried uh, is what's happening in the World Meteorological Organization, which is one of the organizations of the United Nations system uh, based in Geneva which is preparing, which is working on something called the open water portal that will bring together all the available water data from everywhere in the world and help understanding the changes in the global water cycle. So this is good, this is an important step. And it is proposed that such a portal will be used for developing, and I quote, a freely accessible early warning system that would allow better preparedness to threatening water disasters. Now, this is a good beginning, and I think that that's the way to go. But how much time will be necessary before the world really understands the linkages that exist between water phenomena and global warming in different parts of the world and be prepared to produce early warning, which would be early enough, early enough to help people to evacuate on time or to produce protection in time and so forth. So this is very far from clear. And again, we have a problem that could be described. Well, the world is a global community and water disasters demonstrate that. But uh, the world is also not fully prepared with its institution, with its practices, with its level of cooperation, with a level of political will to enable a better level of practical cooperation to address these things. So my, my you know, approach to problems that I have briefly sketched out is uh, fairly pessimistic at, at this stage. Now, uh, the questions uh, such as those that I mentioned obviously have to uh, uh, lead to further you know, thinking. And further thinking means rethinking of, um, of uh, policies, including uh, policies of investment in uh, global public goods at much higher levels. Uh, for example, uh, cleaning of the oceans, uh, for, for, you know, which, is, which are heavily polluted by plastic waste, uh, is clearly a needed protection of you know, common public goods, global public goods, that is the oceans. But does water beyond that represent a global public good? Well, that's much less clear um, because water is considered to be a local and national resource or national good, uh, which has to be managed in an integrated fashion. But that integrated fashion reaches only to the level of national policy, not at the level of global policy. And it is understood that if one wanted to deal with global public goods more more seriously at, at the global level, one would need to, to, to do many things. One would need to change policies completely. One would need to, to establish a system of private-public collaboration 
uh, which would be much higher than anything that was done before. The public finances per se would not suffice for that. One would need to mobilize private resources, private, private capital. And of course, one would need to establish a kind of a relationship between private capital and public authorities that would allow genuine and effective cooperation. Now, that probably means that the public authorities would have to share a large amount of risk and that risk taking and risk management would be developed, de defined in new ways. Uh, again, talking about water, one can say, you know, investing in, in, in water systems, improving water availability, protection of water, uh, better use of water and so forth, all that uh, is necessary. But it's not uh, capital, uh, well, it is capital intensive, but it doesn't bring large profits. The profit margins in this uh, general um, area are low, and therefore private capital is not interested unless it can monopolize particular water resources. So that would require a new pattern of cooperation between public authority and private capital, which we don't have at present. Furthermore, uh, the whole thing of um, the uh, assistance to developing world would have to be rethought. The international development banks, the regional development banks, and the World Bank would have to be developed or changed into, into mechanisms that uh, invest in public goods for the benefit of the entire mankind. And that would require a larger and different type of political consensus that currently exists. If you look at what is being discussed in Sharm el Sheikh, this is the Sharm el Sheikh is the place of the Conference of State Parties on the Convention on Climate Change, COP27. You see that the conference is at this very moment at a complete, de complete deadlock. Uh, developing countries require. Um, a much heavier political and financial investment in remedying the effects which, uh, which are very negative for the developing world and which come as a result from the use of fossil fuels in the, in the industrial world or in the developed world. Uh, of course, this is a fundamental injustice which the international community hasn't been able to address properly. And therefore, the conference in Sharm el Sheikh is not um, a guaranteed success. We'll see what happens there. Maybe there will be some progress, but it is far from clear whether that indeed will be the case. So that's, a, that's an example of where we are. And then obviously when one talks about a greater uh, mobilization of resources for the issues that have to do with climate change, uh, disasters that climate change has produced, and the fundamental injustices which continue to, to, to exist, one would have to be reminded, yeah, sure, that would be very good. But how can you do it at a time when the most developed countries are devoting an increasingly large part of their larger and larger part of their public um, finance to, to military spending, to defense, at the expense of development assistance? So even the earlier inadequate levels of development assistance are being uh, reduced now as a result of of heightened security issues, war in Ukraine, and other political tensions. So we see that uh, there is a need for a fundamental change. We do not know how to get there. I mean, there are proposals in that direction. Uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has produced a report last year called Our Common Agenda in which he outlined the directions for the future. I'm working currently as a member of a high level advisory board, which will bring, uh, which will make more specific proposals to the secretary general and to various international bodies uh, later next year. Uh, we'll try to produce a coherent system of proposals on what needs to be done to, to, to uh, address more effectively, effectively the issues resulting not only from the, from the, from the uh, you know, uh, climate change re related issues, but also to other crises that the world is 
uh, is uh, witnessing today. Now, obviously, we are discussing all these things at the moment when we believe that the worst part of the COVID-19 pandemic is over, and it, we are pleased that, that the effects of that pandemic are somewhat reduced. But let us not forget, the pandemic is still there, and what lies behind uh, may be further pandemics in the future. So the world is not prepared for that either. Now, you see, I have tried to outline in this brief presentation some of the, some of the features of um, uh, the problems today. Uh, you very aptly defined the theme environment, sustainability, and community. I have tried to explain some of the problems of environment uh, which are truly global, uh, some of the challenges to the idea of sustainability which are dramatic, and one of the aspects of the notion of community, uh, some of the aspects of the notion of community which is of course a global matter, not, 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 uh, not a matter of local community or national community or whatever regional community as we talk about in, in the European Union in Europe. Um, we have to think about it as a, as a global community. Now, um, I cannot offer any, any optimistic conclusion to my remarks, but I am prepared to, uh, to answer your questions if you have them and listen to your critical views and also to your proposals. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Danilo. Um, as he suggested, has anyone have any questions? Um, I, what I would like to ask is, um, Let's say we started, every community you start or partnership you start, it's a lot of things you, you don't have in control. And this is the same happens with the wall. So what I, like what I hope and where the change actually rests is on us. You can only change yourself. And the thing is that we first need to show people how to live more sustainable if we discuss sustainability, how to live less um, impact, how to create less impact to the, your uh, environment you have, and then the change can, can start. I really don't believe that there is a way that we can step, like come together and sort this together. I reckon it's like every single individual um, contribution here, unfortunately. Well, if you want my comment on this, um, yeah, sure, I agree. I mean, the individual behavior and individual example is a powerful way forward. Regrettably, we don't see that. We don't see any um, readiness in the developed world to change the patterns of, for example, energy consumption, uh, consumption more generally, or any change of behavior which would help any readiness uh, to assist to the most vulnerable parts of the world. I mean, the problems are only growing. So I agree, if there was a sufficient incentive to change you know, individual behavior, that would, that would be a great help. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have this kind of situation, and therefore one has to try uh, at the international level with political approaches uh, and try to do things differently, which would help people to understand the need for, for change behavior. This is not easy because, for example, when the prices of gasoline goes up, go up, as happened in France a couple of years ago, uh, you know, people start protesting. People don't take this as a necessary a uh, necessary um, approach to reduction of reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, you would not see this anywhere in the developed world. Uh, so, for example, if you, if you start imposing serious carbon taxes with an aim to change individual behavior, you're likely to have a lot of protest and the change of government. 
So it's not simple to, to, to do things at the political level in a way which would help changing the behavior of individuals. Uh, now, I hope that um, we will not need an overwhelming catastrophe for, for that to happen. And the more can be done at the local level, the more can be done with, uh, within a kind of a um, rational political discourse within countries, the better. But politics and rationality are two different things, and they don't necessarily help each other. I have another question, if I may. Can you? Um, yes. So thank you, uh, Professor Danur, for this was really fantastic big picture overview of some of the issues. Um, as an environmental um, researcher, um, I um, thoroughly understand what you were talking about. And I would also like to ask you, um, how do you see working at different levels? Um, you mentioned that community as we, um, have to understand it today is on a global scale. Um, and yet we also need to um, link down all the way to the local scale. So how do you see this cooperation between different levels? Um, what are the possibilities um, or um, how should we approach uh, issues? See, this is of course a critical issue. Uh, and I think one of the ways to approach this is through different uh, new types of management of international processes. Now, of course, this is very vague and very general, what I just said, but let me give you an example. Again, I will use the example of water because it's, you know, it's typical and it, it, it explains uh, things which, uh, which, need to be, uh, which need to be addressed today. Um, you know, in, in water, uh, the only, um, uh, UN conference on the subject was held back in 1977. So that's a, that's a long time ago. And at that time, uh, the issues looked to the international community as primarily something that has to be handled within nation states or within member states of the United Nations. So they agreed on something called uh, the principle of integrated water management. In other words, within a country, water management has to take care of all aspects, agriculture, uh, energy production, uh, personal use, uh, and all that. And that has to be done in a rational way and so forth. So that, that was felt to be an adequate approach. And then of course, since water is transboundary in many cases, um, transboundary rivers, transboundary aquifers and so forth, uh, there, there, there are mechanisms to to deal with that again in a in a in an integrated fashion in a with transboundary mechanisms of of water cooperation. So that was in 1977. Now it is clear that these sort of things are not enough, and one will need to deal with global um, uh, uh, well, the problem globally. And the question is how. Uh, the United Nations will organize a major conference on water in March next year. And um, about three weeks ago, there was a preparatory process organized in New York. And here I come to your question, to the core of your question. And that is um, uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, meeting in New York uh, was meant to help uh, preparing the main conference, which should bring some kind of recommendations to states or some draft decisions to be worked on and policies that would produce, produce a meaningful change. Uh, now, I think that people are aware of the seriousness of the problem. So the preparatory committee uh, was organized in two parts. One was the so-called stakeholders meeting which brought together about 1,200 different organizations, uh, including research organizations, local initiatives, and other non-state uh, uh, stakeholders, 1,200. Now, this is possible today uh, for two reasons. I mean, much of the discussion was held online, which means that a much larger number of, in, of actors were involved. And that was positive because that brought into the picture the perspectives of local communities and created a link between what happens on the ground 
with what happens at the level of the United Nations. So that was 1,200 people. I mean, that's not a small number for an international um, process, international discussion on a very important problem. In New York itself, the number of people who came and physically participated in the meeting was 400. Well, that is not a very large number, um, you know, speaking in terms of political mobilization, but it is a fairly large number in terms of diplomatic um, processes. The UN is now <clears throat> has now uh, changed its, has refurbished its headquarters so that much larger conferences can take place because there are so many non-state participants who are legitimately involved in major UN discussions. So that was one part of it. The other part was meeting of the member states of the United Nations who um, came to discuss how they are going to prepare the ground for the, for the conference next year. Uh, I was worried about this before I went to the meeting because I thought that uh, the uh, political tensions which are typical today are going to, to make it impossible to make any progress. But I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that member states of the United Nations didn't want to put their political disagreements in the forefront. They are sufficiently aware that water is a serious matter that cannot be, uh, you know, that can be subject, uh, subjected to political difficulties and political divisions that exist today. And the discussion was extremely constructive. You know, the, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, everybody was speaking in a, in a much more constructive sense than one is used to see in the, in the political discussions today and in the United Nations, which is a reflection of the political situation of the world. So uh, to summarize my answer, I would say, look, it is not entirely hopeless. There are new opportunities. Some of them are provided by the technologies that we have at our disposal, including the digital communication that exists today. And uh, there are um, attempts, at least um, uh, provisional attempts, to figure out how to make the global discourse closer to what <clears throat> people on the ground feel as a problem or do as part of the solution. If, is this sufficient? I don't know. Is this necessary? I should say, yes. Thank you for this answer. And thank you for your speech. Um, it was very um, lovely and very insightful to hear your um, views and um, your to share your knowledge. I think we can all agree on that. Um, we have a quick few minute break if anyone wants to go to the bathroom here in or online, um, a five minute break and then we're gonna continue um, with um, our next presenters. I wish to thank you for your attention and wish you also a, a calm and a useful break and good continuation. <laughs> Thank you, and we wish you an amazing rest of the day. Thank you.
Ausfall, das hört man nicht zu sprechen. Nein, 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 Okay, everyone, hi, welcome back. Um, we're going to continue with ASIF American Slovenian Education Foundation Junior Fellows for 2022. Um, Ms. Meta Kodric, uh, Ms. Spila Knis, Mr. Tadej Krivets, and Mr. Ringer Gorcic. And the moderator is Professor Bastian Kober, which uh, who will have a few words and then we'll continue. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, I'm Bostian Kobe. I'm from the University of Queensland in Brisbane, and I'm actually lucky to be here in person. So um, I'll um, give you a little bit of introduction actually to two networks relevant to this community. Only one made it, unfortunately, into the title. Um, I'll start with that one. And, and one thing I should say, yeah, I apologize on behalf of Yuri Karlushek, was supposed to um, we did this session together, but he unfortunately had an emergency and couldn't, couldn't be here. So um, now I have to find the right screen. Oh, that's wrong. Sorry, that is the wrong one. <laughs> so I think it might be this one. No. Oh, this one, yeah. yeah of course. Thank you, Kaya. Okay, so now we can't see anything. So um, you can see that. All right. Okay, so the first one, the first network I will uh, introduce and, and give an update on is is called SMUL. Uh, so this stands for Svetona Mreja Universitatea Ljubljana, uh, which means Worldwide Network of the University of Ljubljana. And uh, the objectives of this. Um, network is to connect scientists associated with uh, Slovenia who work outside Slovenia. Um, so basically it was kind of formed to, to improve the Slovenian um, programs um, to, of study and to um, improve the international cooperation between scientists outside Slovenia that are uh, associated with Slovenia and, and also to promote the reputation of the university. Um, so it's basically a very flexible kind of network that uh, basically listens to its members uh, and, and does anything that the members want it to do. Um, but some of those things are obviously news about what's happening in kind of university education and research uh, um, in Slovenia about any job vacancies to attract people back to, to the university or to the university, um, exchange of students as well, which will obviously be relevant to the, to the second thing, asset that I'll be talking about as well, and, um, and teachers and researchers as well, and to plan any projects that, that people can do together, and obviously anything else that's, that uh, the members would, would like it to do. Um, so one of the important things um, or useful things that uh, this network has been doing is uh, it's organizing kind of every maybe every few months a presentation by one of the members. Um, and here is a list of the recent presentations that were that were um, given. Um, the most recent one is by the current president uh, of the board of this network. Clementina von Tatzer, um, I gave a presentation this year as well, and you can see um, some other ones. They go over all kinds of um, topics, you know, from, from life sciences with eye work and, and medical type of work stuff to physics, for example, antimatter and, and astrophysics and so on. And climate change, as you can see, was also one of the topics. Um, so this is the current board. Uh, so Clementina von Tatzer is the, is the president and I've been um, um, attracted to the board as well. So um, all of us will, um, and will, will obviously accept any suggestions, but the, the main thing is yet for you to be aware of, to, to um, be, you know, to, to take place in this network 
the the talks are in Slovenian. So for those of you who are not that that fluent in Slovenian, you can practice in your Slovenian language. But yeah, it's 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 it, it, it's um, trying to kind of promote the Slovenian language in that way. Okay. So the second second one I want to introduce is the ASEF, which is um, the American Slovenian Exchange Foundation. Um, so this is a network that's been that started as an America Slovenia cooperation, and and uh, most most of its funding still comes from America, but it's um, over the years it it's it's uh, accepted other um, countries to be part of it, and Australia, New Zealand are are those as well. So currently uh, unites um, more than ninety Slovenian professors and researchers in more than thirty five fields, more than fifty universities across the globe. And basically, the um, it it kind of um, does two things. One is to um, to enable Slovenian researchers to go and and do some research abroad. Um, so this, uh, it funds basically ten week research visits, um, and you can see the, the countries that, that it currently uh, covers, but it probably will be continue to expand. Um, one of the Slovenian professors is, is the mentor, and uh, it also, um, or, uh, ASEP also organizes all kinds of other um, activities that, um, that the, these fellows can, can participate in. And it also does the, um, the opposite thing, so, so that enables people to visit Slovenia and uh, experience you know, so, so this is particularly targeted at um, young people with Slovenian heritage can go for 10 weeks uh, and, and work at an institution there and also experience Slovenian language and Slovenian culture. So, so these are just some statistics for Australia and New Zealand in particular. Uh, currently we have seven ASAP professors. So Yuri and myself are a couple of those. Uh, and so far we hosted 14 ASAP junior fellows now, obviously, during the 2020 and 2021, this uh, was disrupted somewhat. And as you will see, um, fortunately, we were able to uh, postpone some of the planned 2021 visits to 2022, so so that those um, uh, fellows could could take take advantage. Uh, and we also had a reciprocal exchange. Um, so now, uh, yeah, please visit the website. Uh, it tells you how to become a junior fellow or become a junior, uh, 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 how to become an ASEP professor. Um, now, yeah, so that's that's it for my introduction. So now, what will follow is basically we asked four um, fellows who uh, worked in Australia this year to uh, contribute some videos. Not, unfortunately, none of them, the first, the first uh, um, offer was to, for them to participate in live at, at, this, at this conference, but unfortunately they couldn't do that. So they contributed videos. So now I will just play um, three videos. So, so there, were, there was four um, junior fellows who contributed three videos as he, as he, and, and I will explain why. So the first one is um, Rin Gregoric, who oh this one is today sorry oh and and we can't hear them so how, how do I make the Stop audio sharing. Share again. the box here share some okay. Okay, so now I should, yeah, I, I should start with Rin, who I introduced. Um, okay, so let's hopefully, oh, because the sound. Canberra, uh, where am I okay. taking a practice-led PhD? Okay, it's working now, so I'll just go to the start. In 2022, I was very fortunate to be. My name is Rain Gorogocic, and I'm an artist, researcher, and curator currently based in Canberra where I'm undertaking a practice-led PhD at the Australian National University. 
In 2022, I was very fortunate to be able to undertake a three-month research visit to Ljubljana through the ASIC program. During my time in Slovenia, I was able to do research and make new work within Ljubljana, have an exhibition in Maribor, and travel throughout the country. It was a very enriching experience, and I was able to produce quite a lot of work during that time. I recently just finished a film work, which is based on the Ljubljanica, and I'm hoping to be able to show that within the next year. It was a really wonderful and enriching program, and I really recommend it to anyone wanting to undertake research in Slovenia, as well as connect with their roots and be able to practice language. Okay, so that's the first one. It's Rin. Um, the second one is Tadej Krivets, who worked in Sydney. My name is Tadej Krivets, and I'm the 2022 ASA Fellow from Slovenia. In September, I completed my research visit at the University of Sydney School of Electrical Information Engineering under the mentorship of Associate Professor Gregor Verbich. I was working on probabilistic modeling of electrical load and photovoltaic generation, which enables efficient and robust management of electricity distribution in the presence of uncertainty. Um, this uncertainty is introduced by the merging um, green energy sources and consumers such as, such as rooftop solar photovoltaic systems and electric vehicles. Um, during my visit, I also gave a talk on probabilistic modeling with Gaussian processes at the Center for Future Energy Networks. Um, when I was not working on my research problems, I spent most of my time exploring Australia, which was mostly the Greater Sydney area. Um, I did a lot of bushwalking. Uh, for example, I visited the Blue Mountains and the Royal National Park. Um, I explored most of the beaches surrounding Sydney and also tried surfing which was uh, honestly a pretty unsuccessful attempt. Um, and uh, my favorite in animal encounter were not quails or kangaroos, but uh, friendly possums I met in a backyard in Melbourne. And of course I saw a breach by a majestic humpback, humpback whale uh, while he was migrating on the coast of Sydney. Um, overall, it was a great experience visiting Australia um, where the work at the lab will hopefully be published in a scientific journal uh, and will also be a part of my doctoral dissertation. Um, I, will, I would again like to thank Asef for um, making the research visit possible and also to Gregor for being a great mentor. Um, and honestly, I haven't had uh, much time to travel outside of Sydney, so I would love to come back someday. Okay, and the last one was made together by two of the fellows uh, because they all bo both came were able to came at the si same time to my lab uh, in at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. So they decided to make the video together. They they also managed to work on the same project together. So listen to that. Hello, my name is Svila Knes and I'm a fellow from Generation 2021 and I'm a doctoral student of biosciences from uh, University of Ljubljana. Hi, and my name is Meta Kudrić and I'm also a junior fellow but from the Generation 2022 um, and I'm a master student of biochemistry at the University of Ljubljana. I will first say something about ASEF. As you know, ASEF aims to enhance Slovenian education activities and unite Slovenian scholars and educators across the globe. Uh, the foundation offers a variety of high impact grants and programs, teaching and learning materials, as well as 10 weeks of research visit at Slovenian professors research group. Both Spela and I wanted to conduct our 10-week research visit in Professor Dr. Bostian Kobe's research group at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, and he was kind enough to offer us a position in his group. Uh, their laboratories are situated in the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences buildings at the University of Queensland, and their main focus of research is the structural biology of infection and immunity. You can see the entire research group gathered together here on this photo in the middle. Uh, and this photo was actually taken at the East Coast Protein Meeting Conference in Coffs Harbor, 
where Professor Kobe also enabled us to go soon after our arrival to Brisbane. Uh, the conference was a great opportunity for us to listen to one of the top researchers in the field of structural biology here in Australia. And it was also a good way for Spela to present her doctoral work on the protein TLR10 in the form of a conference paper. So the project that we worked on was linked to my doctoral dissertation. In Ljubljana, I'm doing a research on regulatory role of TLR10 in the inflammatory response in long epithelia cell lines. Um, that's why I wanted to confirm some results from functional studies at a, at a structural level. Um, for that, our aim in COVID lab was to express and purify TLR10 tier domain and its mutant and compare interactions with adapter proteins uh, that are MAL and MyD88 to see if there are any differences. For that, we first cloned TLR10 tier sequence into vector as well as uh, mutant. Uh, then we express and purify uh, different proteins uh, um, that are uh, TLR10, its mutant, MAL and MyD88. And then we conduct some assays such as turbidity assay and um, negative stain electron microscopy. Uh, in 10 uh, weeks of research, we have learned a lot of new skills, we gained uh, topic-related knowledge, and we are happy to say that we also obtained some very good results that will be incorporated uh, in my future research. But it wasn't all work for us. During the weekends, we, we were also able to travel and explore Brisbane and its surroundings. We hiked in the Springbrook National Park, we went whale watching on the Morton Island, and we explored the North Stradbroke Island. Um, and we also joined the Surfers Club and the Mountaineering Club at the University of Queensland, where we met a lot of new friends and went surfing, hiking, and climbing all around Brisbane. And because we loved Australia so much, we couldn't just return back home after our 10-week research visit, but instead we decided to stay for another month and explore more of the Australian East Coast. So we traveled all the way up from Cape Tribulation down to Melbourne uh, and we saw some beautiful things. We went snorkeling at the Great Barrier Reef, uh, we visited the Daintree Rainforest, we petted koalas and kangaroos at Steve Irwin's Zoo, um, we admired the Opera House in Sydney and so much more. And we can say that we're absolutely in love with this beautiful country. Uh, Bustian also kindly invited us to, to a meeting of Slovenian community in Brisbane. Uh, there they uh, read a uh, Slovenian um, fairy tale to the kids and ate Slovenian um, food and drank Slovenian um, beverages. Uh, Bustian also invited us to a meeting of Slovenian professors uh, uh, from UQ. Uh, we were also very happy uh, to see some of the Slovenian goods in stores, such as Cevapi and Vegeta. Uh, and we also shared um, Slovenian cuisine to our friends. Uh, we prepared uh, Skutni Strukli and Mishke um, for our new friends, and they were very uh, happy and they really liked it. So yes, we're very grateful for the opportunity that has been given to us. Uh, firstly, we would like to thank ASEF for accepting us in the fellowship program and taking care for the majority of the costs of our research visit. But um, the biggest thank you has to go definitely to Professor Bostian Kobe for accepting us in his research group, for introducing us to the Slovenian community in Brisbane, taking care of some of the costs of our research visit, um, for all the knowledge he gave us, and overall for making our stay in Brisbane a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. You, uh, you could see Yuri very briefly in one of those photos of Slovenian professors that you know what he looks like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bishan, and um, our junior fellows of ASEF. Um, we're five minutes ahead of the schedule, but I can see Tara is already with us. So I assume she's 
already ready. Um, so our next speaker is Ms. Taya Yerman. Um, she's a Slovenian-born Australian singer and actor, currently living and studying in South Korea. Um, Taya studied the majority of her schooling life in Australia, including a bachelor's degree from the Western Australian Acad Acad Academy of per Performing Arts, and is currently studying her master's degree in opera at Seoul's National University. Welcome, Taya. Thank you so much for the introduction, Nina. And thank you to the Slovenian Australian Academic Association for having me. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak here and share my story with you um, and amongst so many other wonderful speakers and presenters. Um, well, we're very happy. So you can, <laughs> you can begin. <laughs> Um, I'm here today as part of the community topic of today's conference, and I'm so happy to be able to share this experience um, that I've been on with you. Um, being a Slovenian Australian person in today's world has been um, a very interesting um, experience for me personally. Um, so a little bit about myself. I was born in Ljubljana, Slovenia in 1999, and I lived there until I was about seven and a half years old. Um, after which we immigrated to Australia. Um, we immigrated in 2006, where there wasn't such a uh, large community uh, available for Slovenian people um, like there is today. Um, so there wasn't much of a support network. Um, we were kind of basically left alone to kind of fend for ourselves in this big, new, exciting country. Um, and for taking such a risk, I really have um, the most respect for my parents to have done um, such a big and exciting thing, really. Um, when we moved in late 2006, I had recently finished first grade in Slovenia. And um, because of the schooling system that's set up in Australia, I kind of had to skip to the end of year two. So I was in a completely different uh, school environment in a completely, just way over my head in a completely different language that I did not understand and I could not speak. Um, so it's safe to, stay, uh, safe to say that I, I struggled a little bit. Um, and um, my uh, little story, my mom and dad were constantly being called into my school to pick me up because I was having a stomach ache or I had a headache. Um, basically, I just didn't want to be in school where I couldn't understand anything and I just wanted to go home to people who could understand me where I could understand what was going on. Um, and because of this, um, I got enrolled into a special ed class for children who were a little bit slower than everybody else who just needed a little bit extra help. Um, and in this class, the teacher that we had was a man called Dr. Burgess. Um, now, Dr. Burgess was a great teacher. He was a very nice, kind guy. Um, but I still didn't understand anything until one day I had a sort of homework to do. And it was one of those basic um, kind of homeworks that they give where it was like, my name is dot dot dot. I am this many years old. And one of the questions was, I am from dot dot dot. And so I filled in, I said, you know, wrote down Slovenia. I had my mom and dad help, help me spell everything. Um, and when I came in and I showed doc this Dr. Burgess um, my homework, he said, oh, you're from Slovenia. And he said, you know, I know how to say some things in Slovenian. And he said to me, dobr dan and pivo. And from that moment on, I was basically fluent because even though this man only knew two words in my language, finally somebody understood me. Finally, I had somebody who was that little link between completely not understanding and, okay, I think I've got this now. Um, and when I think of that time, it was such a small thing on his part to remember these two words, um, because he in fact actually taught English in Domžale in Slovenia for a year. So this is how he knew these two very basic words, and yet he changed my life just with two words. So for him, it was a very small thing, but for me, it was a life-changing moment. Um, so, oops, sorry. so this instance, um, it led me to understand the importance of language and the importance of having people in the community 
that you can go to that can help you out when you need help. Um, as Nina mentioned, I'm currently studying my master's degree um, in opera at, in Korea, of all places. Um, and being from a musically inclined family, um, actually my grandfather is the one who taught me how to sing. The first song that I ever learned how to sing was Puzimi Porožice Necveto, if you guys know it. Um, and being able to study a degree like opera has introduced me to so many different languages and so many different parts of the world that I probably would never have even experienced um, if I didn't study something like this. Um, why I chose to come live in Korea was because um, there are many wonderful teachers and students, um, really great singers here, but also I felt like I wanted a new challenge in my life. And um, it, um, it was a challenge, I will be honest. Um, I moved mid pandemic, so at the beginning of last year, um, a lot of things were closed. There was not a lot of um, support for international students at the time. And I've even had to um, learn a couple of my subjects in Korean, which um, as you can expect is, <laughs> has been a challenge as well. But it was a challenge that I welcomed wholeheartedly because um, having moved to Australia with little to no understanding of the language, of the culture, of anything, it kind of gave me the confidence to know that it doesn't matter how big the risk is, there will always be an equal amount of reward. So, um, it really has been a great challenge, but a, a wonderful experience so far. Um, actually, Korea has given me this uh, strange feeling of comfort. When I was living in Australia, there was this weird, um, I always had this weird feeling being Slovenian and Australian. In Australia, I was Slovenian, but in whenever I would go to Slovenia, I was Australian. And this kind of created a paradigm in, in my mind of, you know, who am I? what is who am I really what is my nationality when people ask me where am I from you know where am I from um, and being in Korea has kind of allowed me to um, sit in that kind of uncertainty of who am I and be able to recognize that I am proud of both my Slovenian and Australian sides um, actually uh, a funny story here in Korea there is no Slovenian embassy just yet um, and I needed to renew my passport. So I went and contacted an ambassador here who is responsible for this. And he told me that actually there is um, an embassy coming up very soon. Um, and I was able to go to a picnic that they had with a number of Slovenian people. So I have found my own little community of Slovenian people here, um, which has been great because I've been able to learn so much. Um, from them and in terms of um, visa things and just basically living in Korea where I can find this, where I can find that. Um, and, I, you know, we Slovenians, there's, there's not a lot of us, but we are everywhere. We are literally everywhere. Um, so that's a wonderful experience that I've also been able to um, have just being able to speak Slovenian as well is, is gives me such a homely feeling um, to have people that can understand and, and support me in that way. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, also in Korea, there's a, if you want to apply to, uh, for a residency visa, uh, it's, it's a point-based system and you get points for being your age, um, a certain age, um, your level of study, um, these many things, but also whether your country that you come from helped in the Korean War which I don't know if you guys know, but Australia did. So I get extra points just for being Australian. So it's a wonderful thing to be both sides, really, to have these two passports, to have these two nationalities. Um, it's really it's really wonderful. Um, and just being able to have a community like, um, like the Slovenians in Australia and, and this uh, wonderful program, um, program um, like the Slovenian Australian Academic Association um, to help support people and to bridge that gap between these two nationalities is so wonderful because um, you really you never know where where you're going to get help um, and get that support from but it's wonderful that there are things like this um, around so I will kind of wrap up here I guess um, but thank you so much for letting me share my story and um, I really I'm so proud of 
of being able to speak here. I actually um, signed up for SAAA um, maybe a couple of years ago because they uh, you had a um, a sort of a fellowship or like a scholarship program for uh, people in Australia to go to Slovenia to uh, learn more Slovenian. And unfortunately, I didn't get it at that time, but um, it, it's such a wonderful experience, even that, um, for people to be, to um, relearn their culture or their language and their nationality. I think it's um, it's so important that we, we keep that, no matter where we live, that we keep that um, Slovenian part of ourselves. Um, so true. Um, it's wonderful. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Taya. Um, <laughs> we have one question. No, here. no, it's not a question. Oh. It's a suggestion. Can, can you sing for us? Uh, I don't know how good it would be over Zoom. Le po prosim. If you join in. Oh, everybody will. Everybody join in, please. Okay. The Cleokai, the Cleokai, <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Zaya, <laughs> for this additional concert. <laughs> Isn't there any questions for Zaya? Huh? Did you hear the question? Um, oh, I have. When are you coming back? I have plans to come back during Christmas to Australia, hopefully with my partner. Um, so he's Korean, so maybe he'll get to experience. Oh, I thought you were going to marry one of my boys. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Let me yeah, down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully I can introduce yet another person into our little um, community <laughs> living in Australia. I just um, have one quick comment, Taya. Um, thank you very much for sharing your personal story because I think uh, most, if not all of us, can relate to that personal side of um, what it means to come from another country and then face the challenges being in another country, but not quite yet. Um, so sort of like being with one foot in one and one foot in another and like um, everything that um, sort of brings um, on the journey um, and how we can overcome the adversities and sort of embrace it and then see it as a beautiful thing. So thank you very much for reminding us of that. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> can I just say that uh, that Slovenian course, yeah, it, hopefully it's an annual thing. So, so just look out for next year oh, again yeah. and apply again. <laughs> And then you can take your partner to Slovenia as well. <laughs> he's already in love. He loves the mountains. He loves everything. So he's very excited to go. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, Taya, uh, for taking the time and for singing for us as well. <laughs> um, we're on to the next uh, keynote speaker, who's um, Mr. Dushan Olai, a general manager of Dual Company. Um, he's a founder, owner, and a CEO of the company, um, and he's a world leader in engineering, production, and assembling of air-supported structures. Um, he established the company in 1992, and since then, the company spread business through Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. He, um, Mr. Eli, was awarded for his achievements in field of business, participation in Slovenia with the highest acknowledgement, Podietnik Leta 2013, which means Entrepreneur of the Year 2013. And he also received the Slovenian Chamber, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industries Award for Exceptional Business and Entrepreneurial Achievements of 2018. 
The interview will be moderated by Ms. Mateja Stubutnik, who's the president of Slow Oz uh, CHAM, so Slovenian Australian Chamber of, of Commerce. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will just uh, invite Michelle to uh, present. We just have a presentation ready for us. Um, so, Michelle, uh, just share the screen now. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi to everybody. Do you see the shared screen or not yet? Yes, we do. Sorry, just a moment. It is an on presentation mark. It's okay. Yep. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Uh, so hello to everybody from, from Slovenia, from very beautiful old town named where I am running, you know, that we have local elections in Slovenia and I am at the moment running the position of the major of the city of Tiran. And on Sunday will be, will be election uh, day. Now, uh, first of all, I would like to give you a brief uh, presentation about uh, my company that you will approximately understand what I am uh, talking about. So, <clears throat> this is what is interesting in my case. I am a sample of so-called garage company. I started a job in 1992, really in garage. And in these 30 years of my career, we from practically from zero, at the moment we are top three uh, companies in the world, uh, absolute uh, technology and uh, market leader working in plus 70 countries uh, worldwide in all continents, also in Australia, next year in New Zealand too. So uh, we are spreading the market. Maybe it's not so important uh, the earth because as a, as a partner, as a partner of uh, European Space Agency and American Space Agency, we are choose to, as a company um, developing uh, so-called Mars habitats. Uh, my <coughs> business uh, main or major motto, it is one product worldwide. That's mean, that's mean that we made uh, with this, uh, our so-called air supported structures, we, we, we are making at the moment, uh, how to tell you, um, technologically advanced advanced uh, product uh, and the biggest value it is that we have at the moment more than 1500 references worldwide just to show you some some uh, how they looks these air supported structures this is case of football indoor football dome for queens park rangers Land, Italy, Udinese Calcio. This is famous picture. We are, we are <clears throat> uh, practically the, the biggest company in the Middle East uh, making and covering the, 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 the sport facilities. We are also present in uh, technical sector where we are making uh, uh, showrooms uh, for uh, Renault. Renault is one of our partners. Cardiff, UK, Wadworth. This, what is the biggest, how to tell you, the, 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 the real quality of our structures is that we can install them in extremely short period of time. And uh, could be the temperature plus 55, minus 55, or we are talking about the wind speed more than 200 kilometers per hour. Okay, this is Burj Al Khalifa. This is one very, very, uh, I like this picture really because when you see all these clients, how they are looking, looking into our air, know what it's happened here. So it's, it's really <laughs> my favorite one. To continue in South Arabia, we are building the new city of Naum. 
This is the first structure uh, installed in uh, Greenland. This is Siberia gas, gas and oil field in the middle of the nothing where the inter temperatures reach uh, 55 or even sometimes uh, minus 60 degree of centigrade. This is Kamchatka. This is, it was 10 years ago, second biggest dome in the world, more than 15,000 uh, uh, square meters of the covered area with athletic track and uh, spectators uh, uh, seats for 5,000 spectators. This is our last reference in Dubai, Project Danube. This is velodrome, covered velodrome in Slovenia, which is uh, also the, the indoor indoor athletic track. Raymon Polidur in France, also velodrome. This is Sydney, motocross polygon inside. Then in Chile, we, we import import of uh, some ports of Chile. We install the domes, which are as a warehouses covered Olympic swimming pools, tennis courts, ice hockey arenas, and also the, the waste, uh, I don't know what is the right way, waste warehouses. China, it's also <clears throat> one of our biggest market uh, because of uh, pollution, we develop special system how to filtrate the air and uh, make, make uh, more and more comfortable. These are radoms, <coughs> one of uh, mobile, mobile radom systems to collect, to collect uh, data from, from, from satellites. This is one very interesting project. This is a potato storage facility in the middle of the nothing. Uh, Russia lost, Russia and Ukraine lost each year some 40% 40, 40 of the potato production because they could not, they could not uh, on time uh, make deposit of them. So we developed the system where we in, in the middle of the fields, we install these structures and after, after some months, we, we deploy them and then uh, <clears throat> store for, for, for next season. So it looks inside. Okay, this is a patent, patented system of, of uh, uh, green, greenhouses. Uh, this is project for UNIDO, for, for Egypt. It looks inside that way. Dual its actor, others are only reactors. It's my favorite one. Here you can see how we became in, from 1992 uh, up to the year 2000 and today where we are practically all around uh, the world. So in two years, we filled up Slovenian market, 30 structures, Slovenia it's too small to, to, to um, install more of them. So it was necessary to go, to go uh, on foreign markets and we coincidentally entered into former Soviet Union uh, countries where we have lots of demand in these first years, uh, 1995 up to 2000. Then we, in 1998, when, when Russia was in crisis, in crisis uh, we opened Scandinavian market. Then we came to European market <clears throat> in 2014, Gulf and Asia, in 2015, South America, Africa, and from 2016, at the moment, our major markets are Africa plus space. This is one photo from Kilimanjaro. They told me, if you want to enter into Africa market, you must enter from the top. So I take it <laughs> exactly like. So instead of end, <clears throat> in the business, Lex, Fitz Wolf, very, very easy to understand because Slovenia is a really small country. And, and, and if you would like to, to, to build up a serious big company, then you should go into foreign markets. 
Second rule, follow steps of anyone. You will never be able to overtake him. Also important rule, so my way, different way. We are, we are never uh, moving where others are moving. We are all the time looking uh, and checking our own ways. Another of the principles, it's Pareto principle 80-20. With the 20% of power, we will be collecting 80% of profit from the market and then we leave uh, competitors. They, they spend 80% of their energy to pick up the rest of 20%. For me, I am professional chess player and, and uh, uh, really chess game uh, gives me a lot uh, in, in, in my business. Next is a four paper and three minutes. If three minutes are normally the time in which in which uh, someone should tell everything about uh, himself, if he would like to sell something. And all this should stay on one A4 paper. And in the end, 30 years of, of the, the road uh, behind me, um, and I am really proud that I ne never loved that business could, uh, could lead me. So I lead the business. So much about this, and now I'm ready to discuss and talk with you about uh, any question you have. Hello. Hello, thank you so much. Um, thank you for that. Uh very extensive uh, uh, presentation. I'm sure we, we or the audience uh, all enjoyed it. Uh, there's an enormous amount of achievements that you've listed, um, which we can only grasp at the amount of work that was required to, 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 uh, uh, to get to all those goals and to do them in a manner that uh, uh, provides for further growth and opportunities um, and not just uh, another closed door. Uh, so, uh, Congratulations on all your successes throughout the years. Now, um, I, I suppose I'll just briefly introduce myself for the listeners that might have not, might have joined us now or a bit earlier. Uh, my name is Matthias Labudnik and I am the I chair of the Slovenian Australian Chamber of Commerce uh, here in Australia. Uh, the chamber has been uh, established uh, eight years ago and is doing quite well with well connected across Australia. Uh, myself, I've been. Uh, uh, also the former Secretary of SAAA and uh, New South Wales Coordinator for a few years. Um, also had the privilege of uh, managing one of these uh, conferences in Sydney. Um, so this is always a, a lovely thing to, to participate in and, and uh, there's always great discussions here. Um, now, going on to the interview, um, noting you are currently on uh, in over 15 markets around the world, I know that number is larger. I know that the, um, the, your website is often updated with that figure. What are you currently standing at at the moment in terms of global exposure? Sorry, we have some echo. I will try to use my, my earphones just a moment. I will try to switch on to. Do other listeners also have the echo? Is, that, is it at my end? I don't know. I have just a moment and trying to. No, I cannot. But could you could you please repeat uh, your question? So noting you are currently on over 50 plus markets, um, and I know that so you mentioned uh, uh, in one of the earlier discussions that your website is often needing to be updated with that figure. How many markets are you currently um, um, uh, across? Have, has, have you uh, uh, provided services and products to? <clears throat> At the moment, we are 71 or 72 different countries worldwide. So it's mm -hmm. it's growing practically each week, you know, output, our output, it's approx uh, between 110 to 150 structures per year. Uh, so installed all around the world. So it's, it's um, I, we cannot count anymore. <laughs> I cannot count anymore. Neither, neither reaching the, the opening ceremony as so, so many of them. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as, as you've uh, illustrated in your presentation, we see that Jules Air uh, uh, supported structures have a, a vast amount of unique advantages uh, um, uh, uh, to, to your competitors. Um, uh, some of these include uh, an innovative membrane system, 
um, that provides uh, the a top a state of the art thermal insulation system um, um, and protects from from all types of weather uh, conditions and 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 a, a resistance to those, um, which is equally for for the purchaser a very uh, uh, wallet friendly, cost effective, durable, um, and attractive. Um, so would you would you uh, uh, say that your immense global exposure and success is due to this particular fact, or is it the modular structure of the way that business uh, is led at, in 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 your in your company structure? You know, this what is what is the, our advantage comparing to others is this experience. What we got in the past, we made you know we made the first structure in former Soviet Union Republic. Uh, and we, we, we passed through all these problems due to the low, low temperatures, uh, insulation uh, capability and so on. So this, what the competitors generally, uh, they do not have because it's a, it's a really, really very specific uh, market. We have competitor, one of the competitors, it's coming from USA. <clears throat> The second one is coming from Canada, and that's that's all what is at the moment from big one in the market. But much much uh, bigger trigger uh, was changing of the of the business model because we starting as a as a classic trading company, then we start to produce the air domes by ourselves. But now the quantity, it's so big uh, that, that we need to, to change model into in the engineering. So at the moment, uh, we have a part of our own production, but mostly we, 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 we are buying uh, shares with the companies which are welding, they could weld uh, membrane and so on. So this business model <clears throat> helps us uh, at the moment to, that we are in the position where we are. So, so I suppose that one of the successes can also be counter to uh, the way you developed the the uh, the uh, growth um, and global um, uh, entry uh, to markets. Rather than rather than going um, in increasing amount of employees uh, employees and all of the obligations that that, that brings uh, to the uh, uh, execution of further work, you, you've you've restructured the model. Is, is that correct? Are the number of employees, have, have they shifted largely in size or has it still stayed that intimate team as it was from, from the start? <clears throat> now, the, one of the important things here, you know, uh, this, this air dome production, it's a seasonal type of production. So generally, generally we are faced, uh, facing uh, uh, summer time as, as a huge, huge quantity of the orders while in the winter time, there is, there is nothing. That, that, that is one of the reasons that we are sharing uh, and uh, looking for the markets where we can work when, when, the Europe, when in Europe it's uh, snow, that we can work in other countries where is the normal weather. I mean, normal weather from the point of view that uh, allowed uh, the installation. So, 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 who would be uh, would you consider are your most regular customers? Would they be private entities or, gov or governments or uh, um, other I institutions? I we have very poor connection. I, uh, this echo really makes me a problem to understand you well. Once again, please. Uh, uh, sorry. So, would you uh, say the, who are your who are your most regular customers then in in those? In those periods, would it be uh, private entities or uh, government? Uh, government in particular. Fifty fifty. So we have 50 /50. Uh, in Europe. In Europe, mostly these are tennis and football clubs. In Scandinavia, uh, most uh, most uh, are municipalities. Uh, but I am all, all the time. We are we are taking care that that uh, uh, there is no any major client like like it is. So sharing sharing 50-50. Okay, I might uh, I might try to help with the echo, and I might talk just a little slower. <laughs> um, so, just going back on um, the the element of the at the personal level in your presentation, uh, I I've noted and we've noted that uh, uh, you're a very competitive and systematic and persevering sportsman, and in, uh, in many different type of uh, Sports. Um, 
would you say that that is reflected in in the way that you can conduct your business uh, is the is there a mirror in uh, how you go about uh, um, setting goals and achieving your goals in that professional sphere <clears throat> again again uh, i could i could not uh, hear you well just a moment i could try to i don't know what i can do see you really sorry no problem no, I'm trying. I'm just trying to increase the, the voice volume, but not go. So once again, sorry, again, for uh, what is the question? Okay, so we've noted in your uh, presentation, there yes. is a good amount of elements um, on, on your personal um, love towards sport um, and how many sports you do play. And also when you do a little bit of a search across what is currently out there on the vast net of internet, of internet data, there's a lot of people that uh, acknowledge uh, your love of sport and uh, your competitiveness, systematic and persevering sportsmanship characteristics. Um, my question was, would, or do you have that same type of approach, teamwork um, and sportsmanship orientation um, in your professional uh, approaches? Uh, yes, this is so-called push-pull uh, system, uh, very, very shortly. <clears throat> so I, I, I was in the past a marathon runner. Now I am triathlete, Ironman. So I'm traveling all around the world. Next year I'm in Kona in Hawaii, already qualified for world championship. And you know, when you are 10, 11, 12 hours in, in, in uh, hard, hard uh, pace mode, and you fin and then crossing the finish line, then then you can say if 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 I succeed to do this, then I can uh, make success also also in the business and opposite. So this is once again for me this is push pull, charging mm -hmm. charging so, my battery. Yeah, it is so maybe. We, we, we I was just like uh, to tell you in, in these thirty years of my career, I spent more than seventeen years uh, in in the hotel rooms. Not, not at my home. I, I count at the moment more than 2,500 uh, flights. So just for your understanding. <clears throat> um, so, so where would you say you do your best brainstorming ideas? Would it be the office or would it be, found, would, would it be whilst in the nature? Oh, it does, no, I mean, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or that way or another way. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'll just I'll try to keep it quite brief. Um, there's a lot of still things that I would love to touch upon, especially um, the Kazakhstan dome, which was often referred to as um, one of the largest domes in the world. Um, uh, but besides its scale, um, what wins or gains did this particular uh, module bring uh, to your business? Were there many uh, new developments to engineering processes um, that arose from, from something of that size and, and uh, like geopolitical um, challenges that, that that particular area could have brought? No, well, this is simply the, we are talking about Kazakhstan, if I understand yeah. well, yeah, yeah. We're talking about Kazakhstan as the ninth biggest country, country in the world with a huge demand, uh, uh, as well uh, like other former Soviet republics. Uh, um, they have huge demand uh, for, for sport facilities. And the fastest, maybe not the cheapest, but uh, cost effective solution are these our domes. Uh, without any, you know, I am trying to be apolitic in all points of uh, view. Uh, it doesn't matter that Russia was in the past our big market. Now it's not anymore. Just a couple of uh, uh, now. Now we are not working with Russia. I must uh, under know this. I am as well the president of the Slovenian Ukraine um, Business Council. So <laughs> engaged, engaged in all these uh, uh, situations like we have now. And uh, yeah, that's that's my answer. Wonderful. It's all very interesting to me personally. I, I admire the entire structure, the way uh, you've allowed the business to develop on its own and learn from 
what what different markets have taught uh, from all the uh, angles and obstacles that each market can can present. Um, now, there's one other element that um, I would like to, I suppose, touch upon. And so alongside the most known, I suppose, a product, uh, they, they don't, uh, would, um, and, and they're used in so many countless ways. There's also uh, Jules uh, radomes, if I said that correctly. Um, these radomes, which I understand are, are often used for filtering larger radar antennas or satellite disks. Um, is that correct? No, these radomes, this is a part, uh, part of um, research, research and development study, what we made with the uh, space uh, Slovenian center uh, of uh, researching uh, space. What is the biggest uh, benefit of these structures are that they are completely mobile solution. That means that you can you can install install them in any location for a short period of time. Collect collect the the data, uh, and and then move uh, to another location. So not you don't need any construction uh, uh, building uh, permit. Uh, generally, generally, uh, all all the material it's in one or two containers. And it's completely, it's 100% uh, Slovenian uh, uh, know-how. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I, I've, I've come across that in the, in the US, the, the, the Air Force uh, uses a, a, uh, what, what they call the golf ball dome uh, because of its design uh, for detecting uh, uh, threats such as air, uh, air, air, any missile action, uh, destructive weather patterns such as tornadoes, and uh, alike, um, would uh, would the uh, the dual ray arrangements uh, be able to be used for those same purposes as well, or do yes, they really yeah. differ in design? Yes, could be. As I know, in America they used uh, polyester uh, domes for a, for a small radomes uh, um, span. I don't know, 10, 15, 20 meters. While we are working with just uh, um, Taylor membrane or PVC PVC uh, coated membrane, because because the the deflection of signal it's it's uh, almost zero. So the quality quality of the received uh, data from 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 the satellites it's much more, much better in our case than comparing uh, with others. Very interesting. Very very interesting. Um, now, just going back to uh, the vast amount of markets that you're currently in, um, which foreign market would you say uh, has shown to be the most profitable uh, for your particular product and what what is this due is it the legislation or the compatibility with the weather conditions or the strength of the market uh, its economic uh, position or is it a combination of all I think it's it's combination of all for us uh, strategic market it's Europe because it's our buffer system so-called buffer system there we are at home, while uh, to, to markets where we can make, uh, how, how to tell you, <clears throat> I, will, I will not say the, the right word, the, the higher profits, it's probably Middle East uh, because the, the potential in the Middle East is really huge. More and more, we spent 10 years of, of, of marketing that we uh, sold the, the first structure there. But now, now uh, it's really exponential uh, growth uh, of, of the structures. And generally, yes, the weather, the weather conditions uh, dictate, dictate uh, who, who um, should be our, uh, our client, mostly this. Um, uh, now, Lastly, um, for those listeners, which actually your very last slide touches upon this question, uh, so it might be uh, might be already uh, some answers within within your slide there. But lastly, for for those listeners out there who uh, share similar desires uh, to achieving such such goals that that you have in both your professional 
uh, sphere and your and your personal sportsmanship um, uh, um, to establish a healthy business module that goes in line with a, a personal a personal interest of an individual such as sport and music or similar but may lack the funds to embark on, on uh, rolling out a, a, a business venture, uh, whether that's due to the pandemic or, or cost of living um, or the size of, 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 of this, of their uh, family that they might support, but still that the desire the, is there to establish such a healthy business module. What words of advice would you say to these type of listeners? Is there a magic recipe that you can share, share with us? <sighs> It's a question for, for one million. Now, you know, at, at the time when I started this business, there were other times, there was no internet, there was nothing. Nowadays, everything is uh, uh, in possession of the hand. So it's a much, much uh, bigger problem how to succeed and where and where to make this success, you know, and it's... Uh, crazy, crazy, crazy times in front of us with this energy crisis, with, with, with several things, uh, what we are faced right now with the war. So nothing, nothing, it's uh, the same like it was in the past, but still should be goal um, and, and uh, should be a product and should be a client or market for this product. Is it three elements now? Which combination of these three it's uh, in, in percentage? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not clever so far. Okay. Well, I will thank you very much for your time with us today, for the presentation, for your uh, for the, your directions and your honesty. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you joining us, um, and wish you all the success uh, going forward. Um, I might uh, uh, just hand. The microphone now over back to Kai. Uh, as I understand, she'd like to uh, say a few words as well. I do not hear anything. Sorry. Microphone. You're on mute. Okay, so it should be working. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I'll be very brief. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this event. This is our seventh uh, Slovenian Australian, a uh, sixth Slovenian Australian um, uh, academic association conference. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, it's really great to meet all the new friends, our supporters. Um, and um, we're really looking forward next year, maybe uh, pencil this down, 17th of November 2023, we're going to be in Canberra. So um, we're trying to rotate this annual event and inspire uh, both Slovenians uh, and Australians and uh, people, um, especially Slovenians also around the globe. So hopefully... Um, we can continue with this. And um, again, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, before we go, thank you, Nina. Uh, she's done an amazing job. This is a one year work. And also she had like two exams, just I think this week and last week, and she managed to um, organize and lead this event. So big achievement to Nina um, and everyone involved. Uh, we've got Utis. Um, I'm not sure if you can see Nika uh, on the other side in Stajarska, Slovenia. Thank you, Nika. Um, and thank you, Vit in New York. So uh, Utis has been really um, great uh, all these years to help us. They are running um, this Zoom. It's gonna be, um, it's recorded, it's gonna be on YouTube channel for all those who joined later, you can rewatch. 
Um, and uh, uh, Mataya, um, thank you so much for, um, again, interview such a fantastic, inspiring industry speaker, because I think it's really important that we connect industry with academia, government, um, public sector, private sector, individuals, organizers. Um, so Mataya is coming from the Slovenia Australian Chamber of Commerce. And also thank you, um, Boschan, representing here Slovenian, oh, Slovenian American, American Slovenian Education Foundation, ASEF, uh, another fantastic partner. Um, I would kind of be able to continue, uh, maybe just a quick thank you to the embassy. Um, welcome again. Uh, we've got new ambassador looking forward to working uh, with him and his team. Um, Last but not least, um, we've got, um, it, so it's important to mention that this um, event's been sponsored by the uh, Office of Slovenians Abroad, uh, who sponsor us for all these years. Um, we are now in the seven year. Uh, the first year we didn't have a conference, um, so, but we um, established uh, our, this uh, association 2015. Um, and thank you, Mordok University, for hosting us. Uh, it's been great. My first time in uh, Western Australia, personally, and this is the last state that uh, was still on my list. So I tick all the boxes two days ago. Um, did I forget anyone? I could go really uh, long, but I think uh, everyone is a, a little bit tired, um, but I'm sure that you still have enough energy for our conference dinner here in Perth. Nina is organizing that. I have no idea where we're going, but apparently it's very good. And um, we, we found some uh, rooftop bars yesterday as well. So if anyone still has more energy. <laughs> um, thank you everyone in Slovenia, wherever you are or other places in the world. Um, it's been great and looking forward for the 17th of November 2023. We'll be back and uh, enjoy. Thank you.